And it was just perfect. Skiing with the kids, awesome scenery, long lunches, endless laughter. And we even had some powder days where we could get some really deep turns in that went on and on and on. Uh, uh, um, thank you, David. I think that's probably enough for now. Sorry, Karen. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> so, we do have a new face with us this week. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if I should come tonight, but um, my friends said it would be good for me, so uh, here I am. I, I didn't think I was doing anything out of the ordinary. I was doing the weekly shop, you know, as you do. And I found myself in the frozen aisle, just loitering. And then I put a bag of frozen peas on my face. Have you done that? I've done that. Mm. It's been 285 days since my last ski trip, but I still think about it every day. Throwing open the curtains and seeing the mountains all covered in snow. Grabbing your ski boots from the heater. Oh, it's like a warm hug for your feet, isn't it? <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times you go, nothing beats the rush as you jump onto the chairlift. And before you know it, you're at the top, setting off and- Yeah. And those first few turns. Nothing beats those first few turns. Yeah, especially when it's fresh cordial. David! Spoken about this. Sorry, Rebecca. David does have a tendency to get a little bit overexcited. I think I went a little off-piece there. 
Now you mention it, though, I do love a bit of off-piste. Yeah, off-piste is great, but I'm more of a snow park, big kicker kind of guy. I'm more of a cruisy blue stop for a hot chockey kind of gal. Marshmallows on top? Hot chocolate. No, 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 no. It's all about that cold beer after your last run. Oh, you could get a burger with that beer. Or a cheese fondue. Or a cheese fondue. Look, can everyone please just slow down? Did you say slow down or snow down? <laughs> you heard what I said, David. Then I you know what? I love the apres. That thing snowflakes on your tongue. I don't mind a bit of that Euro pop. <gasps> Goggle tons! Snowball fights! First lifts! Green runs! Black runs! Hitting kickers! Beer! Ski school! Powder days! <laughs> Ski obsession can affect anyone. If you or someone you know has been constantly thinking about the mountains, contact Crystal Ski Holidays or visit the website for more information. Right now on Ski TV, the coolest channel, come along and join Jeff and Roy from the Ski TV production team as they explore the great resort of Gestad in Switzerland. to uh, Gestad, you can come and see us uh, here on the top of the mountain, the very top, and as you can see, it's just a magnificent view. Welcome to Gestad. We are here in the wonderful ski gebiet am Horn, here oben, in the ski gebiet Schönried in Gestad. The only thing we can do here tun kann, is here hoch to us ins the restaurant, have a nice time, have a flash of champagne, and just relax. <laughs> top of the peak walk at 3,000 meters at the Glacier 3000 experience in Switzerland and it's a great experience if you ever get to do it. That means uh, it's not, uh, it's high class food, of course, but not uh, like Nouvelle Cuisine or something like that. This is Jack, uh, here in Gestad. And, uh, what is the name of the place? Wuba. The Wuba. This is a lovely place to be. It's, it's, it feels like authentic. It's, 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 that makes you chill out. A lovely place. Very important the music. We've uh, got my own playlists. And you know, food is for your body, music is for your soul. Exactly. So, so it's a whole combination. Yeah. Yeah. Come to visit us, the Wubar. 
So, Completium. The, the customer just wishes and he's gonna arrange it. That's quite a service. And then joke starts. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Very good. Thanks a lot. Thank you for this. Ski TV, the coolest channel. It's time to visit the ski school. In this video, we're going to look into the three most common mistakes when it comes to carving and how they may be limiting you from having less than an awesome time when you're going skiing. We're going to look into the problems themselves and also some exercises and how to fix them. And if you spend some time taking care of your common mistakes, you're going to have way better time skiing and maybe one day it even looks great like this. If you want to carve like this guy, you know, take this video out. And what's cool about this video is that I learned to ski by myself with nobody there to teach me. So I developed like pretty much all of these common mistakes that we're going to show you in this video and also show you some exercises on how to correct them. Let's yeah, exactly. Let's go carving with Kerr. Let's look into the common mistake number one when people are carving. That they're twisting the upper body in the direction of the turn which results in the skis are then sliding out. And it takes then a while to untwist that before the upper body and the skis are pointing the same direction again. And then you already have a bit of rotation in the upper body. That's gonna make the next turn also probably skid out. If you find you have a tendency to finish the turn by rotating up the hill, mm -hmm. resulting in the tails of the skis washing out, then I maybe have a solution for you to try. All right, why should I try? So, you're gonna need to ditch the poles here for this one. A little bit of coordination required. So the exercise we can try, we ditch the poles. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna take our outside hand. In this case, my right ski is the outside ski. So I put my right hand on my hip. My legs do the lovely steering. But I'm gonna counter with my body, I'm taking the inside hand. And I'm gonna point it across towards my outside ski and down the hill, the direction right. of travel. This will then change as we start the next turn. The hands will come up and it will change to the left hand side. Does that make sense? All right, let's see if it makes sense for you as well. Start out focusing on putting the right hand on the right hip when you're turning to the left and then the left hand extends towards the right ski's nose to break that uphill rotation that causes you to skid out. A bonus effect of this is that it helps to angle the upper body more so the upper body is rather straight and then the legs angle out in that way. First of all, practice the exercise as we showed you. And then you can look at details like where you position your hands so that you don't drop one hand like behind yourself. Make sure that you have your both hands in front. If you can see them, it's sort of a guideline that they're probably in a quite okay position. So, Mr. Jens, if you find that you're reliant or have a tendency to sort of just tip the body, drop the inside shoulder to get the ski onto the edge, yep. you may encounter some problems along the way. You'll find that on steeper slopes, you lose pressure and grip through your outside ski, your downhill ski in this case. Again, it seems to be our left one. If you're in variable snow, when you've got kind of powdery patches onto like really sheet icy patches, you get that whole whoo, and you may even, you're gonna have a lunch. You're gonna fall inside. <laughs> and have you're a gonna, lunch? You're gonna slide. All right. Maybe a long way, I don't know. So a little exercise we can have a shot of is we take our poles from the normal position mm -hmm. 
turn our hands upside down on them so that we reveal the poles to the ground in this manner. The pole tips or baskets are going to drag along in the snow. All right. Throughout the whole turn. So our legs are going to do all the lovely stuff underneath, but our poles are going to stay in contact with the ground. Particularly, again in this case, our left one, the downhill pole. And that's going to encourage the upper body to come from this position more into this position, which will make sure we've got a bit more weight on that outside ski to maintain grip. And should I be careful that I don't accidentally go like that and I'll stab the ground? Yeah, yeah, me, so. yeah, you don't want to stab yourself or the ground. Oh, so. <laughs> so yeah, just let them relax and drag a little bit behind you or even just beside you, level with your hips. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do a whole run or a few doing this exercise, but I understand if you don't want to be skiing around like this all the time. So when I was learning to ski properly in my early 20s, I found just being aware of the importance of this and like feeling how the g-forces from the ski and the hand like it's pushing down there adding to that nice kink in the body and putting more weight on the outside ski see it's ha happening here again it's um, just knowing it can make a huge difference if you find sometimes that you're leading in to the turn a lot with your inside ski so in this case if I was turning around there I'd lead in a lot with my right ski and my hip just goes to, onto that ski you might feel like your outside ski wants to break away again you're gonna lose you're gonna lose any grip at the start of the turn and you're just rushing the whole thing by plonking your hip from side to side yeah that's totally a problem I used to have it's understandable because you want to get to that point in the turn where you're gripping and when you are getting lower to the snow However, you're not allowing the turn to be built up right. in an appropriate way. So how should we do that? It's a little bit of thinking along a different process here, rather than an exercise. As we start the turn, as we stand up into the turn, we want to like pull the inside ski back and change that weight onto the new outside ski and allow, be patient. Allow the skis to come around into the mm -hmm. downhill position before finishing the turn with the lovely ankles and knees. Yeah. And I think it could be a good idea that you look down and see how aligned the skis are and that you pull one back and push the other one a bit forwards, right? So essentially the picture's opposite to what we're, we've got going on here. Rather than the inside ski leading into the turn, it's a little bit the outside yeah. ski leading into the turn. And then we'll get more even weight in the skis. Yeah. It'd be sick. Let's yeah. do it. Okay. So maybe you want to look down on your skis and if you see that, that the inside foot is still leading, pull it back. If that's not enough, you can also focus on pulling the inside foot back as you're pushing the outside foot forwards. And if you get this right, it's going to feel way better turning and um, you're going to get a bit more weight on the outside foot. It does really feel pretty good when you really push it in a nice carving turn. Hey, thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned a lot of, about how not to ski. And thank you, man, for joining. All good. I hope it was useful. I hope there were some things in there that can help you skiing. Yeah. If you're unsure, I guess leave a little comment and we can see what we can do. Kurt, get you hijacking the frickin' comments. <laughs> Spiel. I could not hijack. I, I talk about comments. Oh, sorry. And stuff. I, I'm getting too excited, James. I'll back, I'll back, back. back, back off. Sorry. Back off. No, I'm so impressed. <laughs> You're gonna muscle Jens out of his own business soon. Yeah, no. don't, don't tell him. No, no. Should we just. No, I've cut Jens out now, it's just you and me. Yeah. Should we just get on with the stomp it thing and ditch the Swede? I mean, he knows now, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's my show. <laughs>
everybody, it's KTV, Roy, and this is the big moment. I am going to fly, I'm going to go on the paraglide with Rudy over there, and I have to say this is quite an exciting moment. We're a little bit nervous, but on the other hand, I trust this guy, so I'm going to enjoy this flight, I'm surely going to enjoy this flight, and the good thing is I have this one with me, so you're going to enjoy this flight hopefully with me afterward. I'm looking forward to that moment, and see you then. Ciao. this is the end <laughs> this man has given me a lifetime experience I, I I promise you this he started to making curves in the sky and every roller coaster is, is is nothing if you compare it to this I actually I cannot find words for this I no way that I can find words for this Adam Borden you have brought me something given me something that I will never forget in my whole life When I'm in the mountain, my vision is my lifeline. You can't afford to make a mistake. Ski TV, the coolest channel. Get your party shoes on. It's rave on snow time at Salbach Hinterglem in Austria. The coolest channel, my name is Roy, and look at here, we're here at the Rave Festival on the, the Festival of the Berg.
DTV, the coolest channel. Megève in France has one of the most challenging landing strips in the entire world. Ski TV production crew recently hopped a ride to experience the thrill. des éliminatoires. Well, welcome back to Ski TV. I am Hannah White. I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Lightfoot. We are here in the heart of London at the Ski and Snowboard Festival in Battersea Park. And Mark is somewhat of a technical genius because he's come up with an incredible new business. Mark, tell us a little bit about it. Oh, well, it's an it's a online platform um, that specializes in ski properties. It's called Snow Only, uh, snowonly.com. Um, basically, we've built um, a place where buyers and sellers can go to our website, um, have an efficient, efficient platform to buy and sell their ski properties. So it really is, excuse, excuse the sort of comparison, but right move for ski properties. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it is, but we're very specific. I mean, obviously, for ski properties, in my opinion, you need to have um, a certain amount of information to complement the listing. Um, how many blue, red and black runs, um, altitude, uh, lift pass prices, um, and we've got all that information on there that complements every listing that goes on our website. Yeah. So unlike just buying a normal property, you're giving them more information about the surrounding area, about the resort, about what sort of skiing that they can expect yeah, to find exactly. in that location. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's vital information when you're, when you're buying something like that. You know, part of you don't just buy the property, you kind of buy into the resort and, and you have to have that resort information to, to complement it. Yeah. And you're a relatively new business, I know there's been a lot of behind yes. the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we launched about seven months ago, um, but it's grown really quickly. We've got over 2,000 properties listed, um, our, our, our website's been viewed in over 100 countries um, and we're expanding, you know. It's, I think, hopefully, it's something that people want, want and need. Um, the real estate agents want to re reach a wider audience. That's what we can provide. 
our subscription fee is so small in comparison to the commission they would receive. And it also gives private sellers that maybe haven't been able to have an audience an easy platform to put it on. Yeah. Well, the days of shop windows have gone, haven't exactly. they? You know, I mean, and... look, to be fair, saying that, I mean, we, we value local real estate agents. We're not there to to hinder them, we're there to help them. Yeah. They have the local knowledge that we don't have. Yeah. We're just sending them the buyers, that's what we're doing. And maybe we're just giving them a wider reach, that's all. How on earth did you come up with this idea? Uh, I mean, where did it all come from? You live in Asia, I mean, a long way away by Japan, a long way away from a lot of well, well, I was a real estate agent for 10 years, so I feel like I've kind of got the other side as well, so I understand, I understand the process. I, I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of private sellers of ski real estate and they couldn't sell it no. and, and i've been in the game where I, I want a bigger platform and i just thought i mean i know i love skiing so that was a bit of an excuse um, but i was I, I wanted to build something that gave everyone an equal opportunity to sell their ski property you, you know ski ski property is a bit of a niche and i think you, you just need to get an audience and hopefully with the subscription that we receive we can spend on marketing and it works for everyone that's the idea do you have any statistics about the amount of properties owned I, by you it, know all of those yeah it's scary is um it? we found some really good information recently there was there's don't quote me on this <laughs> but it's close there's like six and a half thousand resorts in the world yeah you know, six and a half, one resort being the three valleys that yeah. is made up of, you know, Courchevel, Val, you know, it, it's huge. Um, uh, the lady that I spoke to at Morsey the other day, 3,000 listed residents. It, it, it's, it's, it's massive. Yeah. Parks, it's just ginormous. So the, the, the numbers are, I, I can't even, no. it, it, it's, it's uh, too big. Yeah. What about the visitors to the site, people looking? What, what nationalities are you looking at? Yeah, we've, yeah, tons. Uh, is the UK a big market? UK is a massive market, but for Europeans. And that's maybe where I'm, I think, in the longer term, we're trying to change it a little bit. So most of the European agents go to the UK market. But living in Asia, I know that's not really true. In Phuket, where I met a lot of people, we have people in Phuket buying properties in Deer Valley without even seeing them. You've got such wealth in, in Russia, China, Hong Kong, Singapore. And they want to buy properties in these places, but if the local real estate agent isn't going to do the marketing to attract them, someone's got to do someone's it. So it. hopefully <gasps> then we step in. It's right? an exciting time, yeah, isn't it? It is exciting times. I mean, we, we, we hope we can just do a bit of a service that maybe just makes the real estate agents um, reach something they can't. Yeah. And, and for a very, very small amount of money, for the, for the price of it will cost you know, a nice bottle of wine on the slopes. It's, it's not a, a great expense. And of your listings, is there a particular area? Is, is Europe the focus? Is, is North America featuring? Uh, at the moment, we predominantly um, uh, have Europe as the focus, um, but we have some staff in Australia that will then work, um, New Zealand, Japan, Australia, and then eventually we'll go to America. But I think to start with, it'll be, it'll yeah. be European. I mean, yeah. Europe's such a massive beast to tame anyway. Yeah, but loads, you know, really. and, and also the kind of smaller resorts that people are maybe just don't really know about. Yeah. That it's nice because, you know, most of the people, they talk about the big ones like Bowdazera and Maribel, but there's, there's there's smaller ones there that I think people, there's, there's still property there and well, there's nice places and it might be slightly cheaper and it's quite easy access. So we want to get those listings. And so. I think sometimes when you own a property, you don't always want to be in the, the really touristy places. You know, they're the places you go on holiday yeah. for one week a year yeah. rather than where you own a property. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and also it needs to be affordable for everyone. Like typically if you go to Verbier, you're probably paying $2 million for a property. Not everyone can afford that. So <laughs> not many people, people can Not many people can afford it. So, um, Especially as a holiday home. Yeah, and there's some lesser resorts that are maybe slightly outside Verbier where the price is yeah. it, like it's half the price. Yeah. And, and, and we just want to get a bit of awareness. And, and, and importantly, we want to make it efficient. So if someone goes on to, I don't know, let's for example look at Bao Air, there's every single property in Bao Air. You yeah. don't have to then spend a week with a real estate agent saying this, 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 this. It's just all there. You can do it over a cup of coffee and then go, I'll have that one and that one. It just makes their life a little bit easier. That's brilliant. Now, how can people find you, Mark? Uh, just go to snowonly.com yep. and take it from there, really. Very simple. Well, Sign you up. Yep. You see, the ski, the snow sport industry is vast. It's not just about going skiing. It's about property. It's about travel. And we've got everything here at Ski TV.
Nei, jeg står i aksjefabrikk, men det her er det verste jeg har vært på. Du blir nesten tullet i hodet av Sivun. Nei, det var bra, så det var jo... Det var jo bra i starten, men... I Homeland så sitter vi så lenge i hockey, så vi er jævla stiv i beina. Så det svir jo og brenner jo noe jævlig, så... Men det visste vi på forhånd, men det er vondt faktisk. Selv om det er bare nedover, så er det skikkelig vondt. Så... Nei, jeg tror det var 349 stykk som ville ha slått meg. Så jeg følte når jeg tok teten at jeg ble jaget av et helt felt, da. Så jeg prøvde å ta vare på den gjennelsen så lenge som mulig, så... Det holdt dessverre ikke helt inn. Var det noen skittende triks der oppe? Nei, det var egentlig ikke det. Det var forholdsvis fair på starten her, men... Nå vet jeg ikke hva som skjedde lenger bak i feltet, men jeg har jo lugget litt bak i feltet der på Hommel før, og da vet jeg at det er litt skittende triks folk trekker. Det var helt forferdelig. Beina mine skjelver, og jeg har ikke ord. Det er mye adrenalin. Ja, det har det, men det blir litt for lange etapper for meg det der, altså. Jeg er vant til å sitte i hockey i fem sekunder, og det er det, og det tok det vel seks minutter, så det var fælt.
Hey. It's just uh, it's just fun out here in the sun with all your friends, you know. Yeah, level one to ten. <laughs> ten. Solid ten. Ten thousand. Yeah. Woo! Loving. They're fearless. They're nuts. Catching it. <laughs> By day, they're the finest hot dogging, freestyle skiers in the world. By night, they really take chances. You busy for dinner? Now that's a girl I can take advantage of. This is the motion picture comedy that's proud to go downhill fast. The movie that defies the forces of gravity. Sanity. Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Hi, I'm James from Nick Snow Sports. We've been making skis in London for the past three years and this is how we do it. 
This is one of our bamboo core blanks. Most people don't realise that skis are actually made predominantly with wood, um, with composite layers around the outside. Um, it's actually what gives the ski most of its characteristics. So we use bamboo, it's incredibly strong, it's um, you know, super durable, it's got a really nice flex pattern to it. Um, and this is kind of how it starts out, so it's a big block and it gets put onto the CNC machine, which is where we give it its profile and its shape. So because it's a manufactured wood, it's um, the way that it's made into boards from the raw material is that it's, it's cut up and then glued back together in these very long straight fibres. Um, so it lends itself incredibly well to something like skis um, and it, it means that you can tailor it particularly well to individuals so you can add composites or change the weights of fabrics and, and really adjust the feel of it. So once we've got all the information we need, we take it into the computer and build a CAD model, so a computer model of ski core. From this, we can then send this to the CNC machine, which mills out the profile and the shape of the core. This is where the bamboo core blanks go to be profiled, so the machine will uh, cut it literally to its individual core profile. Um, it's basically sucked down to this with a big vacuum, and then the machine head will cut it. So we can, we can change how it, the, the flex um, is across the length of the ski, we can change the shape of it, we can do everything different every time if we need to. So now that we've cut the various base components out on the CNC machine, we assemble it together essentially like a jigsaw um, before we start to put the edges on. The next step is to bend the edges to the shape of the ski. Uh, we do this by using edge nippers to force the edge into the, into the shape we want. Now that we've got our edges attached to the bases, it's time to get into the onto the cassette to start laying it up. So we're using a two-part epoxy resin. This one's actually a bio resin, and you basically mix the two parts, which starts chemical reaction, at which point we can start laying up with it. And we're essentially wetting out all the different um, aspects of the ski. So right now we're getting it into all of the tines of the, the metal edges, and the epoxy is the glue that actually holds it together. It works in the same way as a glue does, except this one requires a heat to activate it. When different um, materials heat up and cool down, um, sort of you've got like a metal, a wood and a plastic, they'll all do it at a slightly different um, rate. So you need something in between the layers to stop that shearing force from breaking apart the bond of the, that the epoxy makes. So this is essentially a really, really thin uh, rubber foil which goes in between and creates that kind of sort of anti-shear layer. Now we're onto our composite layers. This is um, the first of, we're going to have uh, three different composite, composite layers in this, in this build. Um, this one is a triaxial carbon fibre, which means it's got um, fibres running in three different directions. So you've got fibres the length of the ski to give it um, stiffness along the length, and you've got plus or minus 45 degrees to give it some torsional stiffness. What we're doing here is wetting out the fabric, and then when it goes into the press, that will cure, and that's what gives the, the composite its strength. Now it's time to put the core on. Oh God, my feet are bloody snippy. <laughs> yeah, so the core's on next. These little grooves here are called rabbit, uh, rabbit grooves. They're basically um, little slots that sit over the top of the edges so that when you press it, it all sits flat. You don't end up with a concave base. Next up, we've got the hybrid sidewall. So this is new for this year. So it's essentially a thin strip of um, ultra high molecular polyethylene, so PTEX, same stuff the base is made of. Um, and it sits on top of the side, on top of our Banbury sidewall and gives it a bit more of a um, edge protection um, on the top interface. This is our tip fill, so it's um, again uh, same as the base material, it, it sits on the edge and protects the tips and tails of the ski from impact. So next up we've got our reinforcement layers, so we've got a couple more layers of, of uh, carbon fibre so over the tip and tail and the binding areas. Um, so for giving yourself, you know, giving the ski some binding retention and a bit of extra strength at the join for the tip and tail filler. This is our second composite layer, so it's essentially another, another full sheet of carbon fibre. So again, we're going to go through the process of just wetting it out, saturating all the fibres with resin. We've moved to, to carbon because it means we can drop the, um, the weight of the fibre while sort of retaining the strength of it, but um, carbon by itself gives a very sort of um, lively ski, but not necessarily in a good way, so we, we match it with flax to dampen the vibrations and um, it gives it a really nice sort of damp, forgiving ride, essentially. This is our flax layer, so this is the, the layer that um, adds the damping, so it gives it a bit of, of um, longitudinal rigidity as well, but it, it predominantly adds damping to the, to the carbon fibre layer. Flax is um, a natural fibre, so it's the same stuff that, you, uh, that jute bags are made of, um, and it's yeah, it's starting to be used in the ski industry a little bit more because of its mechanical properties. So the final step of this before it goes into the press is to get the top sheet on. Um, so we offer basically a bunch of different options. There's a lot of stock ones which are the ones that come as standard with the models, um, but you can also choose to have a uh, completely custom design if you really want to. 
Yes, yeah, so we just um, completed the sandwich, putting the top layer of the cassette on, um, and this will help spread the load uh, across the width of the ski when it goes into the press. Now that we've got the top on, um, it's ready to go into the press and cook for a couple of hours. Basically, the setup we've got is an adjustable press, so we can put in different camber moulds, different tip rockers, um, and really tailor the shape of the ski to, to anything, you know, any application. So it's a pneumatic presser that works by um, compressed air being blown into these bags, which puts it down with the pressure onto the, onto the jig and pushes everything into the final shape of the ski. So the press is heated, which is what helps the epoxy actually cure. Um, so we're just ramping up the temperature as, as, it, as it sort of uh, presses, the temperature increases and, and slowly gives it that really strong bond. So now the ski's out of the press, um, we'll let it cool down and then it's a case of cutting it out and we'll start finishing it. Um, we'll start by jigsawing out the rough shape and then we'll start to clean up the edges. Now that we've rough cut our skis, uh, we're going to get them onto the base grinder just to flatten out the bases so we can start profiling the side walls. Now that we've cleaned up the side walls, you can start to see the uh, ski take shape. So the next step is to put a bevel on the side walls. Um, this basically means we'll put an angle onto it to stop you from catching your edges and chipping it. So we've beveled the side walls and now the final step is to just clean up the top sheet, um, shape the tip slightly and then we're good to go. We've now got our, our bevel finished and um, sanded off um, and it's now time to stick this onto the base grinder and do the finishing passes to smoothen off the base so it's ready to go. The last process on the base grinder is this cork finishing belt and this basically just takes off any little micro, micro P-Tex hairs that are left on the base from the grinding process. Now that we've finished with the actual build process, the final thing to do is take off the protective top layer and we're good to go. Yeah, so thanks for following us through how to make a pair of skis. If you'd like to find out more, uh, just go to the website at nicksnowsports.com. TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Red Bull Skills is a wahnsinns Rennen, wo vier Disziplinen auf einmal fast ohne Ski wechseln. Vom Super-G rein in den Slalom, noch ein weiter in die Abfahrt. Und zum Schluss noch mal, äh, der Riesenslalom ist natürlich konditionell auch eine große Herausforderung. Ja, schwierig mit diesen Übergängen. Einerseits weißt du, so ist das gerade von, weil du denkst, habe ich kurze Ski. Und andererseits braucht es noch ein Tor ab und zur Richtung. Mir hat sofort erinnert, dass wir früher wie, wie im Weltcup-Start stehen, so, so ist es zugegangen, ganz weit hoch konzentriert. Und jetzt haben wir ein paar einige gesagt, sie sind brutal nervös. Das ist für den kompletten Skifahrer perfekt, gell? weil so beim Riesenslalom, da kann gleich einmal einer vielleicht ganz, ganz gut dabei sein. Aber da oben, da drehen sie dann die Spreu vom Weiz. Ich habe mir zuerst mal den Laufen angeschaut und habe die Tücken herausgefunden sozusagen. Das hat dann anscheinend ganz gut gepasst. Natürlich mit dem ersten Platz ist schon was Besonderes und das passiert nicht jeden Tag. Super, ich freue mich überhaupt auf dem Ski, weil auf den habe ich mir am meisten Zeit. Ja, jetzt schauen wir mal, dann am 3.4. wird es in die Lenzerheide gehen. 
Und das wird sicher ein cooles Event. Da werden wir alle heiß drauf sein und es Beste geben. Rob Creighton, International Sales Manager, Big White Ski Resort. Big White has always been built just as a ski resort and it's not actually even open in the summer. It's a winter resort. Our season starts usually around the beginning of December and we'll run through until mid-April. It always snows here. It never rains at this elevation and we have 2,500 vertical feet of perfect powder snow. Yeah, the resort in general, it's uh, located halfway between Vancouver and Calgary. If you're familiar with Canada, we're in British Columbia. Uh, we're known as Canada's favorite family resort, located outside of uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. So to get to us, it's, it's quite easy from here. Aussies think that uh, we're quite far away, but uh, you can fly uh, Air Canada via Sydney, Qantas via Sydney, or Air New Zealand via Auckland. So very easy to get to. Very very popular with Australians. Uh, we're actually owned by Australians. It's a really unique weather system. You get the uh, wet air coming off the Pacific that collides with uh, very dry air down in the valley. We're actually just above a semi-arid desert, um, so the snow is dry and light and beautiful all year round. Because of the dry snow, a lot of people can get introduced to skiing powder here where they don't have to necessarily be on a steep slope. They can be on a fairly gentle slope because the snow is so light they can go through it. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Mount Buller crew, we're familiar with them. We actually sponsor the, uh, the Mount Buller Race Club, so uh, very popular. However, our owners used to own, uh, used to own Mount Hotham. It's a very rugged mountain. Uh, we've gladed a lot of the terrain as well, so there's some great tree skiing. There's some really good steeps and there's also wide open uh, groomed cruisers. Everything here is skiable, whether it's on a trail or off piste a little bit through the trees. Mother Nature put the resort here and we just simply took advantage of it. Yeah, so the, the resort in general is, um, like I say, is Canada's favorite family resort. And um, it goes from, uh, we go from 1,500 meters up to 2,300 meters. So it's, it's a little bit lower than, you know, maybe some of the Col Colorado resorts and a little bit higher than, than, say, for instance, a Whistler. So we get uh, seven and a half meters of snow a year. And that's really what we're known for is our, is our snow and the quality of snow because of our inland location. Big White and the Okanagan is sort of smack dab in between Calgary and Vancouver in the interior of BC. So it's only about a 40 minute flight from Vancouver, about an hour from, from Calgary. You do not need a car. You do not need any type of transportation other than your ski or your snowboard because everything's ski to, ski from. All the restaurants are within walking distance. It's a pedestrian village. Uh, favorite hangouts? Well, you know, I like to hang out at Big White in general, but uh, for fine dining, probably six degrees is uh, really good. Uh, if you want to go out to a nightclub or a pub, probably Snowshoe Sands. A lot of places you're on a bus uh, for, for quite a long period of time, whereas here, uh, you dictate the pace. You get out of bed when you want to get out of bed and you go for a, a slide, you can go back to your chalet or your condo for lunch. So you really not only get that, that ski in effect, you actually get the ski out effect where you can walk out of your lodging, put your skis on and ski down to a lift. Uh, we're located at bigwhite.com and uh, lots of useful information there. Um, we've got videos of the resort, there's, uh, uh, there's 360 views of, of accommodation, there's aerial photos and lo lots of information there and uh, actually if an Australian logs into our website from Australia, uh, it will give you everything that you need, I guess, that an Australian would need to know. We're very fortunate with the accommodation because we really do have the whole gamut. You've got everything from a youth hostel on the mountain to your own small apartment. When we've got it all the way up into units like this one here where you've got beautiful appointed uh, luxury accommodation, uh, you know, private hot tub on your deck. Um, just a great winter experience to have. We don't have crowds, you know, we don't have lineups on the lifts. So the pace here is pretty relaxed and I think that carries through to the way the staff treat the guests on the mountain. We uh, pride ourselves on being uh, Canada's favorite family resort. And when it comes down to family, obviously we need to take care of kids. And uh, we think that we take care of kids really well here. 
We've got programs for all ages and ability levels. Uh, kids often progress set. Uh, ridiculous rates. They're uh, from brand new skiers and snowboarders to up on the chairlift uh, within a few hours. Big White has a myriad of different dining experiences here. We can go from the top end in our fine dining environment here like the Kettle Valley Steakhouse all the way through to any of the walk-up cafes and bars and restaurants that you'd find in the village. Once you're here, you're here. Everything is within walking distance, so it's the convenience factor combined with tons of great snow and a, and a beautiful resort village that just is the ease of access. We're really a, a stressless holiday. It really relates back to the people serving you dinner at night or making your beds or tuning your skis. It's not a job to them, it's a lifestyle. And when you can work in a lifestyle that you love, it just reflects on our guests and it just makes for a happier vacation for our guests. Rob Crichton, International Sales Manager, Big White Ski Resort, Canada's favorite family resort, and you're watching skitv.com.au. Jamie Olcott, Ski Club of Great Britain Ambassador. Now this is my favourite workout, the resistant band workout. This little guy is super compact, you can throw it in your bag and work out absolutely anywhere and it really does enhance your workout by adding resistance so you build muscles quicker. First up we have an exercise I learnt when I skied with the Canadian ski team. Place the band above your knees, feet hip width apart. Making sure the other hip stays still, rotate one knee in and pull back out into alignment. Repeat on the other side before lowering into a squat. Sticking with the quad muscles, use a thinner large resistance band because next up we have the box squat. Step onto the band, feet shoulder width apart, Raise the band above your head with wide straight arms. Trying to keep your upper body tall by pulling your shoulder blades together, lower your tailbone towards the ground. Using the same band, moving on to our first hamstring exercise, again stand on the band, feet hip width apart, raising the band over your neck and holding it tight to your chest. Drop your hips back whilst lowering your upper body forward with big emphasis on keeping a straight back. Finish the movement at the top by squeezing your glutes so that your hips end slightly forward. Next up we have a two progression small band hamstring exercise. First up legs only superman. Place the band above your knees and extend one leg behind you with the foot pointing down. Try and keep the hips level throughout. Slightly more challenging is the same movement pattern but standing, either supported by a chair or the wall. Put one foot in the band and extend to a straight leg behind you. Taking a lighter resistance band if possible, place the band just above your ankles and adopt a plank position. Squeezing the glutes, keeping your core engaged, pulse your straight leg twice towards the sky. Using the same band placed above your knees, drop down to a side plank on your knees. Lift the top leg up and down, keeping your body in one straight line. You can also hold in between pulses for a bigger muscle burn. This is another favourite that you see all over Ski Racer's Instagram accounts, the Monster Walk. Place the band above your knees, sinking your hips to the ground in a semi-squat. 
Step laterally, making sure you lock your hips parallel to the ground. The lower you go, the tougher this becomes. Next up we have the monster crawl. Drop down to the ground, moving forward using your opposite hand and leg with level hips. More challenging is to then crawl backwards. Using two longer bands, one to make an anchor, loop the lighter band through. With slight tension on the band, stand facing your pillar or banister, with feet hip width apart and a small knee bend. Move down into a squat and as you extend up, rotate to the side, straightening your arms and letting your back foot extend onto the toes, like the finish of a golf swing. Place the stronger band over your hips. Holding the band with your inside hand, take a small lateral lunge away from the pillar, pushing up and off to balance on the inside leg with parallel locked hips. Ending on my favourite exercise, the only way I have ever found to get massive ski angles without actually being on snow. With the same band layout and positioning as the last exercise, move away from the pillar so the bands are in full tension so that they can take your body weight. Keeping your feet planted, slowly move your ankles, knees and hips away from the pillar, simulating high ski edge angle. Once you're at your biggest edge angle, use the spring from the band to power your hips into a neutral transition position. If you want to see more of my ski fitness videos, then please check out the Ski Club of Great Britain YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me and have a great time on the slopes. Saw you the other day Looking so on the mind Acting like it wouldn't happen Making sense of anything that you could find Because it's just about to happen And you'll be there Have known the storm was coming when the clouds appear. You may as well let the rain come down and join the circus.
I'm privileged to have grown up in the mountains and skied my whole life, and I want to see my kids still being able to ski and their kids being able to ski. People that spend a lot of time in the mountains and people that spend a lot of time outside are basically on the front lines of it all. They can see it happen firsthand. We feel like we need to be doing less of this, less of that. But I don't think it's about doing less, I think it's about doing more. I was a good kid, a strong kid. I'll never be perfect enough for you. I mean, you're stressing the boy out. I lost my way. I'm done. I'm not going to help you anymore until you want to help yourself. Hey, Mom, I never wanted to bring you into this. I just had to get away for a few days. Enjoy the mountain, Eric. Always do. This is the craziest winter I've seen in years. First thing we do is we file a missing persons report. The process will probably take about a day or two. I can't wait a day or two. He is out there. Wait! What do you want from me? What do you want from me? Please, you have to find myself. I don't think I have too much time. I can only get to live life forward. It never makes any sense until we're looking back.
I'm just gonna jump out for like one sec. That's sick. Slide the ice. <laughs> what if I just like slide it super slow and just come off this side early just once? You the think right? that you're gonna die yeah. at the hand rail? Really? Even you know if I go super right. slow, like I'm thinking yeah. slide like literally one meter. Yeah, you're gonna then jump off the stairs, on the stairs, and then you're gonna go straight into the handrail. I prefer to jump on the left side yeah. on my side or something to stop immediately. I don't know. Like jump over I just and like crawling. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah, just I'm just gonna ski into it and see. So sketchy. Okay, do you think you can do it? Fuck, I don't like. The blind ups just. I need to just fucking. Yeah. So scary. Anything you do, even a front. Oh my god! Oh my fucking god! Fuck me! That looks so painful. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Holy fuck, that's dumb. Yeah, that was better. <laughs> <laughs> the transfer was way better. It was like Holy less sketch. Dude. Yeah, no, is your camera good? <laughs> Thank you. 
too fast. Just fighting myself in my head. I let go of the earliest I have that time. Mushrooms? I hate mushrooms too. <laughs> I could tell with the speed, I knew it! <laughs> he was going slower. Boom! What the fuck, dude? Oh my god, that was fucking shit. You okay? Dude, going faster fucked me. <laughs> So many tries, I'm sorry. No, not really though. Don't you like 30 tries? No. I What's that one? BBQ.
<laughs> yeah, I'm using it to like. I think you should just do one front flip for the Please, boys. Superman Dude, front flip I don't think I, I'm not that good at front flips. This like, is, you'd be fine. Gee, you didn't miss the okay. ball. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was an olives. Yeah, it's like two good. favorite things in the world. What's in that far dish? Spinach. Ooh. I <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Making me fuck this. I can't flip you off. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on the podium. Dan's on a podium here. Jesus, that was sick. Good? I've been here in here.
TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. A good start by all four of these women and Anis Moran squeezes out Jacqueline Legere for second place just behind Amanda Trunzo. Anise Moran with great edge work and Jacqueline Legere is, oh, she's struggling a little bit now. She's well back and forth behind Miriam Trepanier through the Nissan chicane. Amanda Trunzo solid on those edges, solid skating. Anise Moran right there. Keeping a close eye on the line. BF Goodrich Rock Drop. Trunzo easily manages it. Anis Moran right there as the two front runners open up a huge gap on Amanda, or excuse me, on um, Jacqueline Legere and Miriam Trepanier. Surprised to see Jacqueline Legere so far back. Amanda Trunzo, a nice lead now on the rest, but Anis Moran not giving any space at all to Amanda Trunzo. Pushing hard across the finish line. Oh. oh my goodness, how close was that? Anise Moran keeps pushing hard to the finish. Miriam Trepanier loops out just at the finish line and there comes Jacqueline Legere. What I'm really impressed by is how fantastic Anise Moran looked in that race. She almost took Trunzo off the start, but Trunzo pinched her off in this corner. You can see the reason Jacqueline got relegated to the back, she took a little fall before the roller section right here pop back up but even just that minuscule up and down will cost you big time but like you said Troy what's really interesting here was Anais like literally losing this race by a skate like it just shows the level she has come to getting better and better she is gonna be the one to really push on trunks in the future along with Jacqueline Legere and Marion Trapani so all four of these women just extraordinary racing Big start by Scott Croxall. He's got that inside line locked up. Mirko Lati right there with him. Luca Delago sitting in third place right now, trying to block out big Kyle Croxall. Kyle Croxall making a great line on the inside, though. He takes over the lead ahead of Luca Delago. Excuse me. Mirko Lati now sitting in second place. Just Scott, goes down. Scott goes down. Scott goes down early in the Nissan chicane. That leaves a wide open for Mirko Lati, who could well take the win here for the first time. And it will be a first big win for him in the senior level. But he's got Kyle Croxall right there with him, and as Kyle's I said earlier on. These two guys are very similar. Kyle looking for that line, and he may well find it. Here comes Luca Delago. He is sneaky, he is fast, he is tricky, and he is good to go. And Scott Kyle Croxall can't outside. find it. Helos goes down earlier, and Kyle Croxall makes the pass on the inside, and Kyle Croxall's got a win. He has got the 1,000 points here in Ivescula. Mirko Lati was so close, but he'll have second place. That is a huge goal for Kyle Croxall right now, and an absolute fantastic win which means Cal Croxall should take over the lead in the overall standings. And Scott Croxall disappointed with a nice run to start things off, but made a big mistake in that Nissan chicane where he just lost his footing in all that snow-covered ruts. Let's look at this from the start. So Scott gets a great start. 
as expected. Mirko right behind him, Luca coming in third. Now Kyle's in fourth position at that point, keep in mind, but he always has a way of staying composed. He makes an early pass right here on Luca. So that's number one pass coming around this corner. He comes the inside, skates his way out. So now he's got his brother and Lati in front. Coming through the Nissan chicane, Scott takes a bad line, gets caught in the ruts, and goes down. Tough break for Scott, but that completely opened the door for Mirko to take this thing home. Now you can never count out Cal Croc, so the momentum he gains on this track is incredible, especially after the rock drop. That is where he makes it happen, and Lati could not do anything. Hey, what is up, guys? My name is Ben Keeley, and I'm a YouTube creator here in Avoriaz in the French Alps, preparing to take part in Red Bull Two Shoes. So, Avoriaz was actually the location where the two Red Bull athletes, Valentin Deluc and Richard Perman, filmed their amazing videos, Moonline and Good Morning. So, I'm here with Valentin and Richard, and before we get up to the snow park to have a bit of fun, I thought I'd ask these guys some questions about their films. So I guess for both of you guys, like obviously these films are big productions. How long did it take to shoot the total film? For Good Morning, I think it's around 45 days. Wow. In Avoria. It took a little bit of a long time because uh, we had a concept. You never know where you go with a concept. Yeah, I suppose these kind of things, like it doesn't matter how much you plan, things are going to come up while you're filming. You exactly, have to adjust exactly. to those kind of things. And to, to put some uh, fluidity into the, the skiing on yeah. the roof, it, w it was really hard to, to make things look uh, easy. How about you? How about for Moonline? Yes, for Moonline it was uh, a little bit technical because uh, I need the good light with the moon, I need the good snow condition and yeah. no wind. So it was very complex for that. It took me around seven months from the preparation, how to put the LED inside the wing, wow. then how to put the energy on the LED. So yeah. I put the batteries in my backpack, then a cable attached to my line. And it took only like four sessions of two, three days with full moon. One of my other questions I was going to ask you was, was it harder for you to fly with the lights or, or not? Yes, because it's around one kilo of LED inside the wing, so wow. the glider is heavier. It's less reactive. It was a lithium-ion batteries in my backpack, Okay. so around two kilos. I had around 30 minutes of flight. Whoa, so you're flying with an extra three kilos, basically. Yeah. Okay, so this is a question for both of you guys. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Flying? I flying? Think. Flying, yeah. yeah. And how about you, Valenta? Maybe swimming because I'm already flying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Richard, yeah. before you were filming Good Morning, did you plan out a line, like a route that you were going to run, and did you pick your tricks based off of that line, or was it more relaxed where you kind of you hit whatever trick you felt? No, we had a line. We knew that we, we had to start with a big building. Yeah, and after that we change all the plan because you never know where you're going with the, this kind of production, you know. Yeah, everything was uh, scripted. Okay, uh, That's we awesome. had a yeah. real uh, storyboard. Now that we're off the ski lift, I think we've got a couple more questions to get through. Valentin, did you do anything in particular, any special preparation to fly at night time? Yeah, before I fly already without the LED. Okay. And when I put it the LED, it was like a halo of light, so you even see less with the LED. Oh, if wow. you are high in the sky, because the light of the moon was uh, lighting the, the faces, mountain. the mountain, so it was even better to see with the light of the moon. Richard, yeah. what is the weirdest trick that you can do? The weirdest trick? Yeah. I think uh, a backflip on top of a rooftop is already uh, enough weird. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> I would like to say it's, the, it's not the weirdest tricks, it's more the location. Yeah, the rooftop was definitely the, the weirdest for me. If you could invent one trick, or do you have any trick in mind that you wish you'd love to pull off? Not really, because uh, I'm, it's more like I, you, I, I do the tricks that I can do, but it's more 
the location that where I'm gonna do it. Yeah. So uh, on the cliff and uh, or on the rooftop or whatever. Yeah. But you know that the cliff is never gonna be the same. So and the size also you can uh, go higher and or smaller. But uh, it's more the location than uh, the tricks I would like to say. For example, when I was watching Good Morning, I was just thinking like, how is this guy coming up with these tricks? When you're walking around, do you just imagine tricks all the time? Like, would you look at a building and say, I want to do a backflip off that? building or how do you imagine these tricks first i go on on, on the top of the the rooftop i check the kind of the slope it's not a slope but yeah. i check the slope and after that i i check the angle with the the camera guys because uh, we want to have a, a impression on the visual effect you know we work with more with the production and after that i imagine the tricks and uh, the way i can do it you know wow that's awesome it shows like how much planning goes into a trick before yeah. you actually hit it what is your favorite station in the world and i guess we'll start with you valentin i I like Aurea because I started skiing here, so I know yeah. the place very well and there is some hidden spots where only the locals know it, yeah. so I like this kind There's of There's the secrets places. that you can't give away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how about you, Richard? Uh, for me, I love the Alps in general and yeah. I love uh, BC, uh, uh, British Columbia in Canada, yeah. Alaska, Japan as well. But, pretty much where the, the snow is, you know? Yeah, where the snow is good. Cool, and I guess to finish off, since the both of you are French, do you prefer baguettes or escargot? Uh, baguettes. Baguettes? Baguettes. Baguettes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, guys. What kind of tricks are you going to be hitting today? The landing is, uh, is pretty icy because it's early in the morning, but for sure we're going to have fun. Maybe a, a 180 and a switch 5. We are going to warm up tranquilo and then we will see. Alright, so guys, that was incredible. I make it look so easy doing the crazy tricks. So uh, today I'm actually going to be participating in Red Bull Two Shoes, as I mentioned. And I just wanted to ask you guys before we leave, do you have any advice for me racing in the in Two Shoes or any tips you could give me to get a head start? I uh, would like to say don't make too much turn, don't break, <laughs> straight the whole way. And keep going. Be like a bullet down. Yeah, exactly, that's the, the old point of the Two Shoes. How about you, Valentine? Be small as you can try down and the most important things don't hurt yourself there you go <laughs> straight and just go but don't hurt yourself thank you guys for everything Thanks, today. thank you that was awesome and good luck Ski TV International here at London at the Ski and Snowboard Show and I'm with Kate Mackay from Mummy Snowboarder and uh, Kate, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yes, my name's Kate Mackay, I'm Mummy Snowboarder. Um, I blog about women, snowboarding and families. I've actually written my first book, um, Take It All On Board, which encompasses, um, it's like a self-development book, but using snowboarding as the vehicle to help people understand how to set up, how they can um, step outside their comfort zone. So it's using that, um, the lessons that we learn in the mountain as to how we can um, take those into real life and translate it to do other things that we want to do in our life. Um, the book came about because my background, I actually do a lot of work around change management and service improvement in the NHS. Um, I'm also a qualified performance coach and I knew from snowboarding that I had lessons that I learned on the mountain that could translate into everyday life. So stood at the top of a mountain and looking down the slope thinking oh this is a bit steep I'm not quite sure I'm a bit scared but I'm gonna have to do it anyway we also have things like that in real life where we think 
actually I need to do this or I want to move into this field of work but I'm a bit scared so how do we do that how do we move outside our comfort zone so we can still maintain our confidence and we don't frighten ourselves so I knew from my snowboarding days and I still snowboard um, that those lessons were translatable into everyday life those lessons were not just on the mountain they were for every day um, and it will be under www.takeitallonboard.com and you'll be able to purchase a hard copy and an e-book there. Kind of look at it and laugh a little bit, like really? This is kind of nuts. It's basically a ski race down a big, you know, big alpine face. I first heard about it through my team manager. He sent me this request that Jeremy Heights is looking for another guy to ski with and uh, to have like you know, a race background and someone that could handle themselves in the mountains. I mean, right away I was I'm like, I'm in. My favorite skier, skier was, uh, was Darren Ralph. It's pretty cool. It's a really cool person, super, super simple, humble. When I think about this, this project, I directly, uh, I directly thought about bringing him here in Switzerland, in my country, to, uh, to try uh, doing a race against him, actually. It's been a project that's been tough to pull off because of the, the weather factors, the snow conditions. We've been waiting for over a month now to come out here and, and have the right window, but it takes a lot of like of the, the perfect snow conditions. It's basically a face with you know just ice on it, glacial ice, and it takes the right amount of like the right quality of snow to stick to it. Snow party, 2018. This run that we're going to ski is something I've never skied, and usually in a race, you know exactly what the conditions are like, and this is a little more of a, a little bit of the unknown. A little nerves, huh? Yeah. My legs feel a little shaky right now. <laughs> <laughs> what we did the other day, though, to get a little more information of the conditions was rappel down from the top using crampons and ice axes. It's a bit icy here. I think we need to maybe put a gate there. Let's, let's check there. I don't do stuff really with ice axes and ropes and crampons. So I just felt like this would be a good way to push myself. When you face something new, you're you start feeling some fear of what you know the consequences can be. You, you you figure out what the risks are and then calculate those risks. We have nothing to compare this to, so it's it's a whole different element, you know. It's it's something that's totally new to me and a, a world that's it's it's fresh and it's fun. Darren, last I five. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, Darren, okay, three. Two, one, both of us have experience in like, kind of both sides. Like Jeremy grew up as a ski racer at a younger age and got into the in the big mountains and I've had this like free ski kind of race background for a long time that got into the, more of the free skiing side. And it's cool to see him expose this area, you know, that he's he skis in and lives at, and this is his style of skiing. And to see that kind of like skiing is outstanding, you know, it's just it's phenomenal, like just amount of skill, physical skill, but also mental skill. And it's a different skill to be skiing like that in these kind of mountains up here. Whoa! Hey Jeremy, this is Darren at the bottom. Hey buddy, uh, snow is very consistent. Definitely picks up some speed on the last three turns. Stay ahead of it, go crush it. Jeremy Heights will be ready. Three, 
So my name is Todd Walters, I'm the Executive Director of International Peace Park Expeditions. So the goal of the 2016 Hyla Ski Expedition is to work with both Kosovo and Montenegro on this political border where this single mountain is in both countries. And there's two organizations, one from Kosovo, the Environmentally Responsible Action Group, and one from Montenegro, the Hyla Mountain Ski Club that are working to promote ecotourism in this area. And they've done an excellent job with three season tourism, spring, summer, fall, but they're working to create a new opportunity around winter tourism. And so this is to show that backcountry skiing can provide that type of winter tourism opportunity.
this small spoon. Yeah. What process? I mean, do you have no kind of platform? Or yeah, so food. Food. Ah, no, no. Oh, yeah, no natural. Uh, hello, it's uh, Bar Sanoya. I work for ERA Group as part of the Wildlife Department. We have been monitoring uh, Balkan lynx for the past three years now. It's very important for us to learn how to ski for my team because we, are, we will be much more efficient on checking the camera traps. And secondly, it's important as well to uh, while we ski, it's important to know the dangers that are above us, so we learned a lot of stuff on uh, how to identify avalanches and how to uh, search and rescue when an avalanche happens. Today, we are enjoying, enjoying the rain in Kosovo, and the guys are actually skiing for the first time. So it's exciting to see them trying and trying and succeeding. Are you ready for it? Yes, I am ready <laughs> to try my ascent. <laughs> Start to clear my mind and not fail this time, I hope. I hope I don't. That's a bit tricky. That's it. So, um, in terms of tourism and ecotourism, uh, how tourism could, could help to develop an area like this, mm -hmm. ecotourism? What is uh, the benefit of it? Sure, so the benefit is that in this area there's a lot of traditional practices that are done unsustainably. Things like logging, things like hunting, things like use of the natural resources. And by creating uh, ecotourism as an income generating and a job opportunity for people here, things like guide services, guest houses, transportation, food, handicrafts, things of that nature, create economic opportunities for people so that they don't necessarily have to go with traditional practices that are now outlawed because it's a national park that has laws and regulations around it. Uh, it's been raining a lot during the last two days, so we finally have a little bit of sun, so we'll try to go and access the peak and see what's up there. so frustrating to see the rain melting the snow away. The possibilities are great here, but we are being very limited by the conditions. Not the best conditions, but it was still nice to be up there and enjoy the view. Our future host from Montenegro came over to spend the night with their friends from Kosovo. All together are preparing to cross the border the following day.
nature side is completely different. We are just missing a bit of help from Mother Nature to fully enjoy the terrain here. So yeah, just uh, two days before leaving, I tore my ankle. Still decided to come on this trip to Kosovo and Montenegro because it's not about only about skiing. It's also about donating the gear and also bringing our knowledge over here. And with the current snow conditions, I felt my ankle a lot of times and yeah, couldn't ski on my vest for sure. So, but anyway, we had a good time. So we, we built a jump for them and tried to show them a different way to use their skis and have uh, fun with them and they played the game so well, they, they tried to jump, they did a few tricks and yeah it was awesome to see them yeah, loving skiing and having fun with their, uh, with their skis. finally falling so we're getting ready to set out and enjoy it. something When we came on this trip, I, I had no uh, experience about the people or I didn't really know about the people down here, about the mentality. And at the end we were really positively surprised about the whole hospitality. The food was amazing. The, the cabins that they have are really, really good, well established. Also the, the mountain itself, it delivers a lot of rideable good terrain. And at the end, we were treated like, yeah, really like, almost like kings. Chin chin! Salut! On our very last day, we left the cabin in the middle of the night to make sure we would reach the top for the sunrise and finally enjoy a bit of fresh snow.
drop in. Going into that area. Oh. Look what he has below him. Oh! The night before a big day, I'm freaking out. I do nightmares. I've met fearless people, but most of the time those are not the guys that ski for a long time. I need to be in stress to, to ride in competition. If I don't have a good feeling, then I just step back. Fear is definitely a part of the equation, competing in free riding. I'm pretty good at deciding where my limit is without passing that line. It goes even bigger! Oh, this time! Oh, that was absolutely incredible. Straight over the double. He has that all dialed in. There is no luck involved here. He just knows exactly his capabilities. Watch this display of amazing technical skiing in really difficult terrain. I want it to look like it's a walk in the park, just uh, effortless and uh, easy. I grew up uh, in Gällivare. It's a, it's a small mining town far up north in Sweden, above the Arctic Circle. So it's pretty far away from, uh, from everything. There's a really long winter there, so that's probably why I came into skiing from the start. Uh, I've been skiing as long as I can remember. My father is a really strong skier. Mom was also a skier. My twin brother and my older brother, wider family, with cousins and most of my friends in Yelvare. We, we had a lot of skiing. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. I was kind of serious about Taipan racing for quite a few years, but after a while I just got tired after, you know, all the strict rules in Alpine racing and discovered the more free ride big mountain part of skiing and that's what I fell in love with and free riding especially and then after a couple of years free ride competitions. Another one of our rookies, Christopher Turdell. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. In Swedish I would pronounce it Christopher Turdell. Also going into oh, the very technical yeah. part. You're gonna see something big. Holy moly. And oh! no way is having an amazing run. Okay, well, that is impressive. That's all green all the way across the board. He won the first contest he ever competed in on the Freeride World Tour. First year fourth, second year third, and then in my third year ended up winning you know, even before the final. Which I'm really happy with because I broke my leg off before Verbi.
it's a lot of work that goes down to a comp. So I'm kind of a control guy, I want to be in control and the way I try to do it is uh, do as much uh, homework you can from what info you have. You have to be super good at scooping lines and look at stuff from below and turn it around in your head and try to imagine, okay, is that possible? Is, it, is that snow good to ski and without actually being on the mountain? You'll go to a riders meeting and get pictures from the organizers and you'll get more and more info. So you try to create an image of uh, what will happen in the future and the more you the more you know, you will definitely have an advantage over your competitors. Is there a human behind the calculating machine? You know, I'm from northern Sweden, growing up in a small town where we don't really talk that much. I think it takes a while to get to learn to know me. You know what makes a champion? When you take a loss as good as you take a win. It's this guy. I never lost though. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out how it works. He's a mastermind. Well, his skiing is quite problematic actually because you look at him and then you're like, ah, oh, this looks so easy, I bet I can do it. And then you try to do the exact same thing and it doesn't work. Christopher Trudell, he has calculated balls. So this is the start gate. I'm gonna do the first traverse. There's a lot of different fears that you experience during the season. You always have those thoughts in the back of your head that you, you can get injured. You also have that fear of losing or missing out or not being able to do what you want to do. Or sometimes you're thinking, oh, I'll be happiest to re-qualify. And sometimes you think like, oh, I'll be happiest as long as I don't look like shit on the live stream. How are you feeling today? I don't know. I haven't really decided where to go yet. But it's always like this, so it should be okay. Those thoughts will always be in your head. So I'll, I'll, I feel like it's best to stay within my limit and calculate that to handle the fear. You have to come to that point to really decide, okay, I'm going here. And that, then you try to turn away that voice in your head. We have someone in the start gate that is defending their world tour title. After that, there's just 100% focus on that line. Taking that same air off the top of Berkeley and looking like he's got a slightly different plan than, and now looking to get himself into his line in this ultra technical section. Taking that top one big and sending it straight into the pocket. He's so good at lining up that transition and managing to shut it down without his skis chattering as well. I don't know how he does that. His technique is on point. You know, I, I talked to Christopher. He said he's been working and it really shows. Been working on being smooth. Christopher's got his suspension set real stiff. He is such a strong skier. A little bit of a side slap on the landing of that three. It was just too flat. But putting in a backy as well. Looks like he was going to under rotate. But pulling it around and taking another air off the bottom. He was so fast by the time he hit that third one. A little bit wild down the bottom. Super smooth and fast at the top. Putting in two tricks. So fluidity all the way to the max. We haven't seen a single score going to the end of the judging criteria for any rider in any category and the smoothness that he has been working on paying off there. I wonder how much the side slap is going to hurt him on the three. So an 82, that's a solid run there for Christopher Jordel. I'm not happy. I felt like I was close to falling a couple of times, so I should, maybe I should be happy about it. So we're going to have a look at the championship ranking. Marcus is still way out in front there, 7,200 points, but Christopher Turdell second at the moment defending World Tour Champion. So I think technically Christopher could still win. So many things at stake, so many things at play. It's all coming down to this. 
if you want to be at your best and compete and beat the other guys on back to Ross, you need to have a being scared. You have to take some kind of risk to put down a good run. It's really inspiring because it's the most difficult. It takes big mountain skiing to the best and top part of it. Being good at Verbia really proves that you're a good skier. If you win the extreme, that is something that just cements your place in the Hall of Fame. Jeg står jo aktivt fatt ut, men det her er det verste jeg har vært på. Du blir nesten tullet i hodet av syren. Det var bra, så det var jo bra i starten, men i homelen så sitter vi så lenge i hockey, så vi er da stiv i beina, så det svir jo og brenner jo noe jævlig. Det visste vi på forhånd, men det er vondt faktisk, selv om det er bare nedover, så er det skikkelig vondt. Jeg tror det var 349 stykk som ville slå meg. Så jeg følte når jeg tok teten at jeg ble jaget av et helt felt. Så jeg prøvde å ta vare på den gjennom så lenge som mulig. Det holdt dessverre ikke helt inn. Var det noen skikkende triks der oppe? Nei, det var egentlig ikke det. Det var forholdsvis fair på starten her. Men nå vet jeg ikke hva som skjedde lenger bak i feltet. Men jeg har jo lugget litt bak i feltet der på Hommel før. Og da vet jeg at det er litt skikkende triks folk trekker. Det var helt forferdelig. Beina mine er skjelige der, og jeg har ikke ord. Det er mye adrenalin. Ja, det er det, men det blir litt for lange etapper for meg, det der. Jeg er vant til å sitte i hockey i fem sekunder, og det er det. Det tok det vel seks minutter, så det var fælt.
going back to why I started skiing in the first place, just ride exactly what I want, when I want. Just allowing me to have more time and creative freedom to like focus on the unimaginable. Try and push my riding to just new heights. reason why I want to do this just represent the sport for what it is at its purest form really like bringing uh, snowboarders into it as well I think really captures the whole style of what we do always just get mad energy and inspiration from just different people in my life and just keep going because there's so much love It isn't by getting out of the world that we become enlightened. It's by getting into the world. By getting so tuned in that we can ride the waves of existence. We must explore. We must reach into the unknown.
everything we could be. Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Welcome to Fieberbrunn in the Austrian Tyrol for the third round of the Freeride World Tour 2019. Some parts of Austria have amassed nearly five metres of snow and so the conditions on the face could be very different from previous years. And here is the face, the Wildsee Loader. There are 581 metres of vertical with an average pitch of 48 degrees. Its exposition is north by northeast. And for the first time, there is only one start position for all of the riders. First up was the men's snowboard with defending champion Sami Lubke, the first to drop in. We are kicking off the Freeride World Tour stop here in Fever Run 2019 with Sami Lubke, the defending world champion. And look at the weather, look at the snow, look at this guy go. All right, Sammy is making his way into the guts of the face. You can see the snow moving, a little bit of slough running, but just on the surface, conditions are fantastic up there as he makes his way now into this closeout shoot. Sammy Lupke getting things started here as he moves down. Smooth air out of that section. There was only one way out of there, and he made it look like it was no thing. Cruising down through this powder now. As you can see, kicking up snow from his board, airing into the wee uh, small amount of sluffy debris that we've had from heli bombing the face this morning to make sure that it's safe for the riders. And Sammy looks like he's enjoying this right now. Oh, it's so smooth. Sammy now just riding through the sun. The, the, uh, the, the snow clouds that he's kicking up just make it look perfect. He's going to head over to the rider's right side. Big three there over that natural mound. Sammy coming back towards the base of the chute, and he's going to get one more feature here. That's right, nice big backside three before putting in an indie grab. Cruising on through this bottom section and looking to line something up. Looks like the snow's pretty nice. Getting a wee air off the bottom there and cruising out the bottom to finish off a smooth run. There was a way to open things up from Sammy Lubke, the defending World Tour champion, making things look easy. Looking at Davy Baird rolling out of the gate, he's going to be heading over to the rider's left side. It's good that our uh, setup crews left a little ledge for them to squeak across there. That's right. And the heli shot. Well, look at that background and the foreground. Everyone's looking stoked there. David Beard getting across the front of the face. Love the way he tweaks his methods, especially on GoPro. He gets the board so sideways it goes invisible. And now traversing across. Wonder if he'll uh, head straight to the same bomb hole as Blake Ham, because Blake's left a track straight into it. David managing to ollie over it, and so far on the same run as Blake. Yeah, Davy taking a slightly different approach, going over on the on the other side of the couloir. Going to be looking to get uh, get his entry started with a bang here off this drop, right over that exposure. A big move there for Davy, and another one that he finds right into his own slough. That's actually a nice spot to land. Wow, Davy, that was pretty solid. Making that shoot into a double landing in his slough, as you said, it makes landing a bit blind, but maybe a little bit softer and tweaking one of those methods. Yeah, classic Davy Baird run here and getting the three right over Blake's track. This is a fantastic run right now for Davy Baird. He is on a heater. Cat-like on the twisty three there and then going for the mute off that bottom here as well. Wow, this is going to be a pretty up there run. We've seen two solid American runs so far and we're seeing another one right now. Yeah, this side really showing well for the snowboarders. It's smooth, it's stylish, it's playful. It's, it's, it's as I said before, it's finding the line that suits your style and that's exactly what we're seeing Davy Baird do right now. Flying Frenchman, 
don't know why I started calling him that. We've called lots of other Frenchmen that, but he does fly this guy. Third ever will to a stop here. Won his second one in Canada only a few weeks ago. Taking that early drop in there, making his way across already with the style and absolutely charging. Look how fast he's going. And a three already. Wow, this is a heavy hitting run. He hasn't even got into the main part of his line yet. Taking that four line. Nice work off the Hoysel cliff, named after Stefan Hoysel. And of course, no stranger to free ride as well as freestyle, Victor Delarue. If you haven't seen his movie Frozen Mind that came out this season, then you should watch it because it is unbelievable. And run right now is unbelievable too. Two threes already and charging through the section. Holy damn, this is hot speed. So corked out on that last one. And look, there's not a single turn there, just a long flowy slight direction change looking like he's going to head down into the couloir zone maybe head for this classic jump this one's uh, a bit of a favorite for the riders as it's got a nice little kick to it yeah victor heading across there another three he, i'm losing track of his rotations he must be getting dizzy up there 1080. <laughs> this is a favorite hit as well seen tricks before seen grabs before and these bottom hits have actually seen people come unstuck before so i'm glad to see victor taking it cross court to find the training coming out hot Gigi Roof was hoping for big things on home snow, but couldn't maintain his incredible momentum on the top section all the way through the face and had to settle for fourth place. Next, it was the much anticipated men's skiing category and the man currently leading the overall standings, Marcus Eder. So he's heading uh, towards the snowboarder men's zone over to the Sunny Pow side. Uh, we're going to see what he's got in store for us over there. That's right, Marcus, such a nice guy, and as you say, such a relaxed attitude, but such a super sender as well. Taking that top hit big, and that's into exposure as well. I'm not sure if you could see it from the camera angle, but nice 360 there as well, joining the Victor De La Rue club. And looking for a transition over here, maybe. Yeah, getting a little face shot there as he popped the top off the spine, and now moving across, getting cross court there, finding transition, super smooth there. This is really creative in the classic Marcus Eater style. He's always just got a slightly different take on the on the face. Now he's going to come in underneath this thing and getting still making his way back up across there. Transitioning again, transfer airs. We love them. He obviously loves them. And that's a really good pick today with the snow, I think. If you go four line, it can be hard to shut it down. So popping up and over to give yourself as much speed or as little speed as you want to land in exactly the right place. Really smart skiing from Marcus. Yeah, lining up a nice laid out backflip there, and he's going to get cross hill off this one as well. Smooth top to bottom run for Marcus Eater. Andrew Pollard, the man out of Alta, Utah, he has a style all his own. He's a very smooth rider, super creative, always finding the cross court options, and he's heading over for the Sun Pao experience. A-pole, they call him, taking that top hit pretty damn deep. How did he get that speed? Not sure, but he's a creative magician looking to turn this one into a double. No hesitation at all. That will be great for his fluidity score. Yeah, A-pole absolutely pinned. He's heading over here to the riders left in the sun with a big three and getting it dead clean up high on the wall and then another big hit off. This is super smooth. Andrew Pollard looking to show his his kind of style, his creative take on this face. Right now, things are looking great for Andrew Pollard. Yeah, I love the way that upper three kind of pops you into a transfer air that takes you straight down to the next cliff. And a cork three off that one, grabbing it out. I didn't know this guy was such a freestyler as oh, well. Oh, yeah. This is exactly what Andrew wanted to do. He loves the cross-court stuff. That's what Alta is all about, finding transition. And now, getting finding it in the lower section here. former Scandinavian Big Mountain Championships winner. Yeah, we're going to see, as you said, they were travel compatriots. So taking that same air off the top is Berkeley and looking like he's got a, a, a different, slightly different plan than, than what we saw from Carl, but maybe not. He's heading into the Eagle. That's right. Similar line from last year for him so far, taking that top one big and sending it straight into the pocket. He's so good at lining up that transition and managing to shut it down without his skis chattering as well. I don't know how he does that. His technique is on point. You know, I, I talked to Christopher. He said he's been working 
and it really shows been working on being smooth a long leg is a strong leg and he rarely uses his whole travel you know if you think about the 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 way your legs move as suspension and christopher's got his suspension set real stiff he is such a strong skier a little bit of a side slap on the landing of that three it was just too flat but putting in a backy as well looks like he was going to under rotate but pulling it around and taking another air off the bottom a little bit wild down the bottom super smooth and fast at the top putting in two tricks things are just getting crazy down here Mikel on course now going straight into the Gnar section. He's so fast, so quick and confident into these exposed sections. I hope the camera zooms out in a second so you can see how massive the section is. He's going for the same line as Tom Piper so far and just pointing it through there. Looks like he almost clipped those rocks, but no hesitation. Doesn't seem like he's worried at all. So fast through here, just making it look like a cruise. Yeah, very, very fast through the exposure. Not getting up to the, uh, the traverse that Tom, Marcus, and Liam got. Holy cow. Well, Mikhail Bimbos right back to the well that delivered the win last year. And that, this year, there's a lot more shape to the uh, to the terrain after. And so into the air and then into the air again, but so balanced. So Leo Slemon looking, uh, looking to have a say in that podium situation right now. We'll see what he's got for us. That's right. Ask Leo how his ankle was doing after his injury kept him out of the first competition. He said, yeah, it's okay. It's stable. And Christopher Turdell showed me him doing a 30 meter double backflip. So I feel like it's doing pretty well. He's got high standards for himself and he's getting straight into the steep, gnarly zone. What's he lining up for us today? So much slough pouring down that it's going to make an amazing photo. Is he going to try and double across this pad? Yes, he is. What a sick move. No one else saw that. No one else has done that. Second to last skier guy opening up a new line. Oh, Leo Slemet finding the sneaky double there. That was so exposed. That must have been terrifying to ski in there. He's, you got to be so confident with your scoping. Obviously, he was because he hit it perfectly. And now he's over in the sun section. So a really, really cool combination. Super creative that he's moving from the ultra steep into the sunshine here. And now over in the... Uh, Riders right side of the couloir section hitting these jumps as we've seen a few other riders do Laying out a backflips perfectly to beat. We haven't seen that many people stop that so well So Leo really really solid run here. That looks like a lot of hard summer training paying off It was the Japanese rider Yu Sasaki's birthday and although he couldn't take the podium He was presented with a cake in the finish area there was plenty of other drama on the field sea loader though. Stay tuned for an extraordinary event at the end of the show. The first ski woman to drop in from the top of the face was American Jackie Pollard. She is a free ride tour stop winner already this year and she is looking to back that up right now. First woman out of the gate and she is heading down the ridge. You can see the winds had a little bit of uh, a little bit of an effect on it, but it's definitely still grippable and rippable and Jacqueline Pollard making her way out to the skier's right. That's right, placing first in Canada in the kick course stop and now starting first here in Austria. See how it goes for her. Sammy Luki first out of the gate. He did well. Kyle Regner Erickson first out of the gate. He did well. See if we can continue that trend with our young American rider here today. All right, so finding her way now into the line. Jacqueline chipping off the corner there and getting on the downhill ski, trying to find her way into this far skier's right section. She's got her landmarks picked out and she is heading over to the closeout. Jacqueline Pollard now making her way down. She's going to try and make this look as smooth as she can. She points it out, and Jacqueline Pollard clean on the left foot, arcing. Look at the skis bending. This girl knows how to ski. She knows her technique, and she knew her line exactly. That was basically executed the exact way that she talked about in the face check. Now she's uh, she's got these last couple of features here, and then... Uh, well, hopefully going to be coming through the finish line with a big smile on her face. That's right. Absolutely lacing that top section. Super impressive from Jacqueline Pollard. And taking another sender down the bottom, straight full line, picking that transition perfectly. And like you say, just arcing those skis down the bottom here. Beautiful race turns in the race back. Hedwig Vessel trying to find the line that's going to suit her ski style. She comes from the mogul background. Um, so she's, you know, technically she's a strong skier, but of course she's got a deep bag of tricks. We saw in Japan that massive backflip that she threw and took it right to her feet, super clean landing. So she's heading out 
into the sunny pow zone where we saw um, Ariana and Ava go, and we're going to see which side of this spine she ends up on, looking like she's going down to the Stefan Hausel clip. Yeah, that's right. Stefan Hausel, of course, a nine-time free ride world tour competitor, won the event in 2011 by hitting this cliff that Hedwig is lining up right now. And she sends it full line, stomps it like it ain't no thing, just looks so solid on her skis. Is she a racer as well as a mogul skier? That was cool. She went off the biggest possible part of that and landed like she had never even left the ground. Now Hedvig trying to find the, uh, you know, the more playful aspects of the run. We saw, we saw this zone play really well with the snowboarders. We saw Ariana and Eva go over here, so we know this section scores well. She's going even further over. I think this is the same uh, section where we saw Eva go. And uh, yeah, just getting another clean hole. These, uh, these, these athletes, they're so smart in being able to pick out the clean spots to land. Looks so solid in the air as well, Hedvig. First time we had a Norwegian rider on the tour for a while. I think the last time was Torgrim Borle going back a few years. So cool to have a Norwegian back representing Scandinavia, getting into the jumpy, playful, getting into the yumps now. <laughs> yeah, this section has definitely seen a lot of play, Hedvig. You know, she she wants to find a spot where she can throw the freestyle and she yeah, sure does. Yeah, Hedvig! Sick backflip from the Norwegian. So stoked to see that. She is the last one in our women's ski category this year. If I had to guess, uh, she's going to head over to the rider's left, which it looks like she is. She's going across the ledge there. I think that she, by her going over there, she's picking the line that really suits her ski style super well and, uh, and I think gives her the best, uh, best opportunity to show her best self. That's right. Powerful Swiss rider lining up this cool section at the top into the shade now, although that was in the sun earlier in the day. The rain said she thought it would stay cold and it looks like it has, so cold smoke for Elizabeth Gerritsen to land in. Stomping on that one. They've really made that cliff look easy today. Yeah, and that was cool. I mean, just in terms of, uh, of technique and ski quality there, she landed with one foot in a bomb hole on a rock and it didn't even phase her. She didn't slow down, didn't bobble, no balance issues. So she's coming across to the high section here where we saw Hedvig and, and Eva go and maybe going right off the top ropes from where Drew Tapke went and super clean again. Elizabeth Gerritsen putting one down here. Yeah, Elizabeth, this is a really strong run from her. Super psyched to see her right back on her feet. Called her young and small in the first competition of the year and she didn't really like it. Made fun of me on Instagram about it, but apparently she was just joking. So I think we're friends again. I want to be friends with her because she's such a rad skier. I'll follow her around and she can show me how to do fun stuff like this. About to hit this jump now. Tweaking out the stylish tail shifty. Yeah, and she took a similar uh, a similar approach uh, to Jackie on that upper one where she went a little bit higher and made sure that she didn't get squashed in that flat section. And then another air, kind of a more of a roller air. That was a nice clean run for Elizabeth. Ariana Tricomi has been the skier to beat so far, but sitting down on a landing cost her another podium. Finally, the female snowboarders took to the face and first in was Erica Vikander. Heading into the sunshine. She's gonna make her way down. We got the, the heli shot from behind. So, all right, here we go. Now we can see exactly where she's going. So right into the guts of it straight away. She's heading over on her toe side to find her way into the guts of her line. Definitely uh, exciting. You know, always exciting watching her ride. The way she can throw the freestyle elements in is, uh, it, it always comes as a bit of a surprise when it's just like, bam, there's a trick. Yeah, like the half cap she had off the top and kicking horse just a week and a half ago. So slashing that ridge now, enjoying the powder and that spiny field. We're talking to her about her line uh, just yesterday and she was saying she wanted to enjoy it, get into this pow and slash that ridge. Surf style, park style, looks like she's having fun so far. Yeah, treating it like a wave, smacking the lip a couple times and then uh, off, chipping off the bottom of the black crack there and now just enjoying this powder. Eric Vikander on a beautiful looking section here as she's gonna head into this sort of peppery zone, clean onto her feet as she moves across there. And now she's gonna come across towards the sunny section as all the riders wanna get out of the shade and into the sun and enjoy the sparkly pow. Sparkly power experience for Erica Vikander now. She got lined up for us down the bottom. Alling off the fun, rolling, playful stuff that we've seen quite a few of the snowboard guys go into as well. So I wonder if it'll be a popular one with the snowboard girls. 
I feel like it is. I mean, this this section just lends itself to snowboarding. It looks like where you'd want to go if you were on a snowboard because you can just surf through there, getting the grab there on that lower section. Um, yeah, it just makes it look like the exact kind of spot where where uh, snowboarding would be fun. For sure, and lining up a big cliff down the bottom here. Dublin down through it, catching Trenny, making it look easy. And ollieing off that one as well. Lots of features in that run. Anna Orlova out of Russia representing, unfortunately, her compatriot Ivan Malikov taking the year off due to injury, blowing his knee, unfortunately. But still doing some pizdiet stuff in uh, the first off in Pakuba, taking home the win. So we're looking to do that again today. Really strong rider, like you were saying, is a, comes out of a freestyle and sorry, free ride focused background where she spends a lot of time in Shergesh and Sochi to prep for the season before she heads over to Kormaya. So travels a lot, rides a lot, gets a lot of different experience in a lot of different places. And now coming down into the gnarly shoot at the top here. Yeah, we haven't seen any of the snowboard women take a, take a chunk of this section, getting herself a little bit of a face shot there, getting pitted. This is so steep in here. Neil, you said you skied this line in a comp back in your day. That's right, I did. And now a snowboard woman skiing at the level has come up and away. Impressive stuff to see Anna airing into that zone, actually. Yeah, definitely looking to bump up her line score with this. Nice grab, too. Yeah, Anna Orlova definitely trying to get, uh, get her campaign for the podium going here looking strong making her way back into the shade as she comes across you can see her cleverly avoiding that debris field there is some old debris uh nothing nothing moved this morning when they bombed but when it got really hot last week definitely some things came down some old debris out there so the riders and anna particularly very clever to avoid that definitely uh doing herself a favor by not riding into those those uh, microwaves size chunks. That's right. Anna just coming back into the sun. There's a bit more shade in the face this year because we run in the competition earlier in the year than we usually do. But Anna getting into the sun, taking the air off one of the yumps down there, lining up the bottom feature. A little bit blind. It's quite rolly overy, quite convex, but wants to get off the ground again, wants to air out this bottom to finish your line in style. Doing so, taking it four lines, stomping it. Super solid from the Russian. It's Marion Erti, and she is on course. That's right. As you're saying, guaranteed podiums now for Anna and Erica, not guaranteed for Maria. I'm sure Maria will be stoked to get a podium after two fourth place finishes so far this season. But on course, and I would not be surprised to see her on the podium. Marion Erti going straight across to the lookers right section, of course. She's a strong rider. It's a strong part of the venue, and it's exciting to get to a new part of the venue that we skipped the other parts of before. Yeah, so Marion looking at getting up on the ridge top into the uh into the same really steep and technical section that we saw anna and uh manu go into and really clean through there throwing a slash turn her slough just pouring over the edge this is looking good right now for marion archie she's ultra clean and really fast through there just ripping through it really strong riding you can see how her technique is playing to her advantage there and her strength uh, i assume she must do some kind of physical training to to keep a core that strong because she really muscled her way through that top section getting a grab in the next next hit as well yeah so throwing the style element marion rt definitely she's got she's got i think one of the most well-rounded blends of the big mountain technique but also you know she's got great style she's got those grabs and she's she's always looking to find a way to add some style element to uh to the air getting over into that that far skiers left section or riders left section of that air so right now marion rt making a strong case to put herself on the podium that's right. It was a saying. Previous uh, World Cup slopestyle rider bouncing away through there. Looks like it's a lot of fun. As we're saying, the snowboarders have really been enjoying this look as right side with the guys and the girls. Oh, look at that big slash turn. The snow just going up. They're going to be loving that up in the uh, up in the viewing area as that snow just hangs in the air, lit up by the sun. Ra Marion Erti there with another air, finding the way finding the way to link up these natural rolling features. They just seem to suit the style of the snowboard riders really well right now. That's right. Got me and Maria Noll, the photographer in the helicopter, getting shots of that, and I reckon that's going to look sick. And so does Marion RT. Hands in the air, celebrating. She's stoked on her run. Defending champion Manuel Amanda was looking great until she got caught up on the landing, which threw her completely and saw a crash again moments later. So another win in the men's snowboarding for Victor Delarue, this time ahead of Davey Baird in second and Sammy Lubke in third.
That means the Frenchman has extended his lead at the top of the overall standings, with Davy Baird in hot pursuit in second. Marcus Eder claimed his second win of the season, this time from the American Andrew Pollard and Leo Slemet from France. The Italian now has a huge lead over defending champion Christopher Turdell. But the real fight is further down the table, where the men are battling for qualification places for Switzerland's Verbier Extreme at the end of March. It was a fantastic win for Hedvig Vessel in the women's ski, with Jackie Pollard in second and the impressive Elizabeth Gerritsen in third. Overall, Ariana Tricomi still leads from the American, with Hedvig now up into fourth place. Marion Herty wins again in the women's snowball with the Russian rider Anna Orlova second and American Erika Vikander rounding up the podium places. With two wins and a second, Frenchwoman Marion Herty leads the way from Anna Orlova with the defending champion Manuela Mandel in third. I mentioned earlier in the show that we would have an extraordinary run for you. Here it is. Craig Murray, the winner in Canada, attempted a huge cross-court transfer on the Ville Sea Loader, but was thwarted by rocks. Thanks to the efforts of the safety team here, he was able to get back to the finish area and was able to ski away relatively unscathed. It shows you just how committed the riders are and highlights just how precise everyone has to be at this level. Next stop is Ordino Arcalis in Andorra from the 2nd to the 8th of March. We'll see you there. Hello and welcome to the penultimate round of the 2019 Freeride World Tour and it is crunch time here in Andorra. With the category championships to be decided and qualification for next year and the Verbier Extreme all to play for. And here is the face, the Quince Metros, which is a change from the original mountain because of the adverse weather conditions over the last few days. There are two starts available to the riders with a maximum vertical of 390 meters and an average pitch of 43 degrees. It might not be as steep or as long as the other faces, but it will reward creativity and linked lines. First up was men's snowboard and Davy Baird from the United States dropping in. Three. Yeah, one. He is still in the hunt, along with Sammy Luki and of course Victor De La Rue is at the top of the hunt. So here we go, Davy Baird on course. Making his way through the steeper top section and lining up a big drop here. Davy Baird sending it back into the cool while stomping like it ain't no thing. Really solid legs from the Elastic Style Master. Yeah, that was great. He found the perfect spot on that slough cone to uh, give himself the transition. Again, lining up the angles. Davy Baird knows what he's doing. He knows how to find those landings. And you know if he gets into the air, it's going to look good because he is the master of the tweak. Yeah, just like that, he called it and then it happened. Making his way down the looker's left side of the venue, quite a ways away from where the other guys rode and finding fresh track so far. Yeah, this is definitely a, a completely different line. He's over on the other side of the face. A big air there for Davy as at the bottom of the face. Really interested to see what the judges are gonna do with this in terms of line score. Oh, just buttering out. That's what, kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier. The riders are having fun up there. They're making it look fun. The judges love it when it looks fun because it's more fun to watch. So back up to the top, Blake Cam, just such a such a, an amazing human and also an incredible snowboarder, so strong and stable. That's right. I think he was also unlucky to have missed out on that recap of who is in the title hunt because he's been doing so good this season. He could be there too. Switch 180 half cab off the top feature. First one to trick that. Oh, yeah. And a big three there from Blake making his way through this technical section up on top. And he's going to move, move his way into this technical uh, couloir sort of section as he, uh, as he finds his way over to some of the more riders right feature. Another 180 there. Blake Ham really bringing the freestyle here. Yeah, that's right. Similar line to John Powell and Ludo so far, but different hits, same area, getting lots of hits, tricking most of them, enjoying the powder in another 360, backside 360 off that second to last hit. I wonder if he'll hit the same bottom feature as the other snowboarders we've had so far today. It looks like he is going to. He's approaching it, finding his way in as Blake Ham clean on the landing there. That's going to be a solid run for Blake Ham. He should be happy with that. Thank you. 
right now it's all about Andorra and it's all about Victor De La Rue as he starts his campaign off. So Victor De La Rue coming out of the Lookers right start gate, the same section we saw the first snowboard is going into and his compatriot out of France, Ludo Guillaudia, taking that one super deep and putting it straight to his feet, which is good because he had to ride around some rocks straight after. So far through the section, spinning there as well. Really impressive run from the potential free-eyed world to a champ in the yellow verb. Victor is absolutely flying. He's got the heat, he's got the intent. He wants that tour title locked down today and he is showing it. Look how fast he's going. He's more than three quarters of the way down the venue. Toe side carved there and he's coming into this bottom air with some heat. We're gonna see if he can pull it off. Yeah, stomping there, a little bit of a hand down, maybe, I'm not really sure. Putting in a nose budget on the bottom. Uh, nice indie grab before that last feature. Defending champion Sammy Lubke looked like he enjoyed the mountain, but lost control on a couple of landings, which cost him valuable points. In the men's skiing, there was an amazing run, which we'll show you later, so stay tuned for that. But now it's the Frenchman, Leo Slemet, in the gate. So Leo with a 360 right out of the gate, heading over there and adding a couple of features. He's definitely upping his feature count as he heads down into this zone. 360 there off the same one we saw Tom hit a little bit earlier, but a very different approach into that section for Leo. And another 360, three 360s so far, and he's only halfway down the top of the face, treating us to that freestyle show that we thought we might see, especially in the playground section, the lookers right. But now going back to the free ride style, stomping down on that top hit before making his way quickly to this bottom here as a double. Yeah, Leo Slamet approaching this one. There's been a bit of a classic landing right next to the bush. Absolutely solid there. Leo Slamet lighting things up on the bottom half of this venue with some uh, classic free ride style. So we're getting word that Christopher Turdell is going to be heading off behind the peak as uh, we saw with Aymar Navarro. Not sure if he's looking to make that same entry. We're going to see him pop into view uh, pretty soon as he's just making his way behind the ridge. There he is. And now looking to get himself into his line in this ultra technical section. Christopher Turdell starting things off with a bang. It's right, same top section as Aymar Navarro and then a backflip just like Mikhail Bimbo. So combining those two amazing runs so far and a 360 as well. This guy is on a heater and he's looking to get on the podium and continue his chances of taking home another free ride world tour victory overall. That's right. Christopher Turdell needs to uh, basically needs to stand on the top of the podium if he wants to keep his title hopes alive. With Marcus falling, that kind of all goes uh, goes crazy. But Christopher Turdell yeah, <laughs> taking it deep there and super clean. That was possibly the fastest run or up there with the fastest runs we've seen. Ultra clean. European podium at the moment, but someone looking to change that. Andrew Pollard coming off a podium in the last stop in Fever Run, 360 off the top. You know something about this guy. Yeah, A. Paul, he's got that Alta style. He's always, he's, I, I, I kind of see him as, uh, as the, the fresh-faced Drew Tabke. He's always looking at things just a little bit differently. He calls them the mystery lines, and he knows how to find them. He's got that, uh, he's got that eye for the, for the terrain that uh, just lines that other people don't see. And so far, things are looking good for A-Paul. Yeah, really smooth, solid, fast run. The fluidity must be super high, as well as the Aaron style. Coming into this bottom hit at pace and styling that one out as two, stomping it so perfectly, making it look easy. Yeah, that was a blasting run for Andrew Pollard there, looking clean. Here's another man who wants a good result here, Carl Regner Eriksson. He has been throwing flat fives off crazy small jumps. He's got the skills, and Carl Regner Eriksson, he's heading around the back. We're going to see him pop out, and I think uh, he might be heading into the same section as we saw Christopher Turdell. Yep. That's right, and Ayman Navarro, super smooth through there, landing straight on the snow. I think Christopher was a little bit closer to the rocks than that. Carl laying out a massive backflip too, straight to his feet. Such nice style and a 360, very similar run to Christopher Turdell so far. 
Yeah, these guys, they scope together, they hang out together, they speak the same language, and uh, they definitely have, you know, slightly similar skiing styles. Right now, Carl looking to uh, to match the run that we saw Christopher Turdell throw down as he comes into this air nice and clean through there over onto the right foot and making his way towards the final feature. He's going to take it from that uh, more classic angle up high as he gets onto the other side of the bush and straight across right foot traveling over the bush there. Carl Regner Erickson, that was looking like a strong run there for Carl. Tanner Hall crashed for the second round in a row on what was otherwise a great run. Liam Pfeiffer also struggled on the landing and took out his frustration on a bush. And what of the overall leader, Marcus Ida? Only needing to finish in the top six, the Italian skier still risked it all and lost a ski when he crashed out. The first woman to drop was the American snowboarder, Erica Vikander. She was on the podium, and she is on course here in Andorra. That's right. Podium finish in February. Looking to back that up with another podium finish here to get a spot in Verbia and for next year. Already in air off the top, putting in a grab there and coming down into the steeper, more technical section straight away. Yeah, Erica Vikander now making her way into the upper half of uh, what we've been calling the playground. Freestyle friendly, and Erica is a, uh, well, she comes from a freestyle riding background as she makes her way now with a couple more features heading into the kind of the meat of the playground. Now, Erica definitely looking to throw some style into her run as that is her trademark. There we go. We're seeing it now. Yeah, we saw a 180 from her already, and I think a switch 182. I think she might have been just behind the rock from our angle on the first of those 180s, meaning she was riding switch for a while. Pretty impressive in a face like this and finding some fresh snow now looking to really get through this fun looking shoot she's pointing it through there coming out hot and surf slashing that powder it's a pleasure to watch from the lady yeah erica vikander mandatory air in the middle of that shoot she's the first rider in there of the day and showing that it is a zone to be reckoned with Anna Orlova definitely loves to get into the super steep techie stuff and uh, make her way through that in a fluid and smooth fashion. She's got a win this year. She's got a second. She's got a sixth place that she would probably love to throw away. So she is underway here in that super steep technical section. Anna Orlova making her way over to the rider's right. We haven't seen a lot of action in this section yet. That's right. Not from the snowboard woman and not from any category. In fact, she is in the steepest, most technical part of the face that you can get up to. A little bit of exposure there making sure that she gets off that on her feet. And bouncing through there, that's cool to see. Uh, it's definitely her trademark style to go into the exposure and, and come through the, the compulsory airs. I think it really challenges her uh, mentally and looks cool for, for anyone viewing these. Is it what you want to be doing when you're choosing your line? You want to be looking into stuff that people, oh, where she's going to go? What's she going to do? How's she going to get out of this one? You want it to be like a, a cartoon where like, ah, oh, they can't possibly escape from this. Come back next time. Yeah, that's right. So Anna making her way all the way across. But as we said, when we we're talking about judging uh, criteria, she wasn't traversing for no reason. She made her way over there to hit that air. And uh, I may have had a hand down, but it could have just been a slash and another feature. So this run absolutely packed with features from Anna Orlova. I think for sure, if we're going just based on uh, the number of uh, number of features, number amount of time spent in the air, logging air miles, she has uh, definitely got the most air miles out of the snowboard women's category so far putting together a super diverse run. Next up, we have Maria Kuzma, and she is already on course. Yeah, so Maria Kuzma looking uh, looking like she is off to a good start here. Fast, flowy. Uh, uh, she she lives in Bali when she's not uh, riding her snowboard. So definitely always kind of showing that surfy style, which I really like. It's definitely, um, it's always fun to watch. Yeah, airs and grabs off the top two features and getting to a more technical section now. The rocky, bushy, pickpockety air making her way through there quickly. Like it ain't no thing. It's a slightly more technical zone. And uh, putting in a nose but a three there as well. Cool to see, bit of style. Yeah, right now Maria, can look, Maria is looking <laughs> surfy here and great to see that bit of style. And she's going to head into this shoot once again, like Erica, finding a line that nobody else has touched all day with an air and then, oh, just throwing those gorgeous power turns down. Maria Kuzma looking like she is having a blast out there. Yeah, that looks like so much fun to ride right now. Like we're saying, you look like you're having fun. The judges are going to look like they're 
giving you a good score. They will be giving you a good score, not just looking like it. Maria Kuzma finding her way out of the venue now. That was a pretty quick one run too, as well as a couple of hits, a couple of grabs, some power slashes and an untouched shoot. Pretty complete from the Kiwi. Marianne Harty is at the top, and if she wins here, she is 2019 Freeride World Tour champ. Marianne Harty out of France, 2017 world champion, looking to take the title back today with a win. She could do it. Uh, Marcus Eder didn't manage to in the skiing guys. Victor De La Rue didn't manage to in the snowboarding guys. Will we crown a world tour winner here today? And Marion Erti starting off strong, taking that top here deep. Yeah, that was huge. Marion Erti is showing that she means business here. She wants that title. She wants to stand on top of the podium. Of course, the other women who are currently down there are definitely looking to get involved. But Marion right now looking strong. That was a huge air off the top and she is charging. Really fast run, fluid and smooth so far. Three big ears and stomping them straight to her feet. No hand down, no butt check. Putting a grab in off that one. A little bit tail heavy like a boss, just bouncing it like it's a park jump. Super smooth stuff here from the 2017 world champion of freeride snowboarding, Marion RT, and stomping that one clean too. Sun's out, guns out. <laughs> Marion Herty stamping her stamp of approval on this venue and getting another one of those mystery pops at the bottom. Such a strong run, super fast. Wakanahama out of Japan is underway. Yeah, as you said, it's steep and technical up here. We're kind of always looking for those gnarly lines coming down to the lookers left so far. Heli following around, sun's out. Snow's a little bit scraped off from the other riders that we've seen come down through here. I believe Anna Allover was also in that section. And Wakanahama enjoying the fresh power that she's finding there. Slashing away. Looks like a lot of fun up there, Derek. Yeah, this kind of surfy pow, it just seems to lend itself to snowboarding. It makes it look so much fun, and the riders just surfing down, throwing those big plumes of snow out as they make their turns. Wakanahama making her way through that open pow field as she now approaches this air section. Nice and clean through there. Wakana is, oh, she got a face shot on that one. Things are looking good right now for Wakanahama. She's currently the only track in the section as she comes across and rejoins with some of the other tracks and now headed over a little bit more to the rider's left. So linking a bunch of features together, starting from the steep and more exposed Nally start in the lookers left and enjoying this pound power fields down through here. Like you said, a few features that no one else has hit. So making the most of it, fresh landings. There's been a lot of riders so far today. So it's smart line choice to line up things that are still gonna have fresh landings and, and no tracks in them. 58.33, that's putting her into sixth position. Neil, what does that mean? Marion RT is free ride world tour champion 2019. <laughs> All the celebrations in the finish area were for the new world champion, Marianne Haerty from France. Finally, the women's skiers dropped in and Jackie Passo from the United States. All right, so Jackie Passo, she's coming out hot. She's showing that, that aggression right out, out of the start gate and straight away finding a pocket in that air. Jackie Passo looking strong so far. Yeah, that's right. Two ears straight after each other without much turning in between. So really strong start to the run. Coming to the lookers left, riders right, rather than to the playground on the lookers right, as most of the other riders have gone to. And lining up a big air that we saw with Vedic Gorik backflip and Aino Navarro send. Jackie taking it deep, a yeah. little bit of a backslap, but stomping it from the American. Absolutely massive. That is what we have come to love about Jackie Paso runs. When she goes, she goes all out and she's got more in store as she heads her way down. There's only one track in this section and now there's gonna be two. Jackie yeah, Paso! Jackie Paso! Same era as Yu Sasaki, owning the second track in there today after Yu was in the skiing guys category. So fourth category, lots of riders through the venue already. Jackie Paso finding some cool creative stuff and sending it massive. Hazel Birnbaum won the event here in 2015 in Andorra, so good to have her back as she is retiring this year, see if she can do that again. Uh, hopefully she makes it to Verbier as well and we get to see her ski, her trademark, big mountain freeride style as she's already showing that here today. Really quick through the venue, taking that top air and like just slicing this run, enjoying the power, moving quickly through the venue. 
Yeah, Hazel heading into this quite technical section in the middle, and as she gets down through the pepper, points it and is out clean. Hazel Birnbaum definitely looking strong. She has got that turn shape that the judges love. Super fast, really fluid, and going for the transfer there, Hazel Birnbaum making her way down. You know, she, she always is, uh, is kind of focused on speed, which is something that I really appreciate about her riding. She's fast, but she's also fluid, and she packs it with stuff. Hazel looking to line something up here on the bottom section, going big and yeah. stomping. Yeah, Hazel, tough to find, sending it straight into the pocket. You can see the snow's a little bit deeper there from a wind deposit and just not going forward, not going backwards. Super impressive skiing from the American. Right now, who we got on course? Air Ariana Tracomi, your reigning freeride world tour champion, and she is hungry for a win. She definitely wants to, uh, she's, she's got her her trademark 360 that she's been looking at. She got shut out of it in Bieberbrunn. She wants to throw it here, and I'm sure. There you go, 360 <laughs> from Ari Tracomi stomping it. Yeah, that's exactly what she wanted to do. Ariana has been looking for that, but she also has such a great style. There's another 360 for Ari, getting a little bit back in her uh, in her stance, but able to muscle through it as she comes down now into this lower section. Ariana Tricomi on a heater. She's already had two 360s. Is she going to be able to match the uh, record made by Leo Slemmett there for, with three? Yeah, similar run to Leo Slemmett so far. Free ride inspired, creative freestyle taking that bottom air, stomping it, making we slalom turn around the bush, maybe a hand down, then a couple of mystery poppers at the bottom in the sunny power experience. Ariana Tracomi staking a claim for a potential World Tour win. Jacqueline Pollard gonna give it her best shot here as she heads out and over to the rider's left side of, this, of the venue from start two. That's right, so exciting stuff, the last ride of today, and we could still have a world champ crown either way, being Jacqueline Pollard or Ariana Tricomi. So, airing straight off the nose of these two top two hits, she's skiing fast and sending it pretty big so far. One of the things that really is a highlight, a standout of Jacqueline Pollard's style is how fluid she is. She makes these massive turns in areas which uh, other people are making shorter turns in, and she never hesitates off her hairs. She's straight into the airs every time. And as you said that you really like to see, uh, and what I like about the way Jacqueline skis, is she, when she's gonna go off something, she's gonna go right off the front of it, just like she did there, finding a fresh landing and definitely staking her claim to stay in the title race here in Andorra, Neil. Looking so solid, smooth, going big on the airs, stomping that one as well. So like I was saying before, it's gonna be interesting how people do going big and back on that versus going smaller and stomping clean. As I was saying before, it's better to see people doing things that they know they can do well and executing them perfectly. I think it's exactly what Jacqueline's done today. The winner from Fieberbrunn, Hedvig Vessel, had another great ride here, but was docked points when she couldn't quite stomp her landings. So a second win for Jackie Passo in Andorra from the overall leader, Ariana Tricomi, and another Jackie, Pollard in third, which means Ariana is still favorite to take the title in Verbier, but Jackie Pollard and Hedvig Vessel are right behind her. A first ever win for Blake Ham in the men's snowboard category with Victor Delarue in second and Davy Baird in third. The Frenchman is still the overall leader and like Ariana, Tricomi looks favorite to win, but Davy Baird is still in touch for the showdown in Switzerland. Former champion Leo Slemmett took the win in the men's skiing from last year's overall winner, Christopher Turdell, with Andrew Pollard in third. The crash from Marcus Eda means the title isn't decided just yet, but the Italian skier still has a commanding lead from those two past Freeride World Tour champions. Marian Hayati has been crowned the champion, though, after another win here in Andorra, with Anna Orlo the second and Erika Vikander third. Here's confirmation of Hayati's dominance this year, but all of the women will be looking to claim the Extreme Verbier title at the end of March. Now, here is that bonus run that we promised you, an amazing backflip from Vardek Gorak, and you could see just how stoked the French skier was as he came into the finish area. Next, it's the season finale, the Extreme Verbier from the 23rd to the 31st of March. Need we say more? Join us then.
TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Red Bull Skills is a wahnsinns race wo four disciplines auf einmal fast ohne Ski wechseln. Vom Super G rein in den Slalom noch ein weiter in die Art fahren. Und zum Schluss noch mal, äh, der Riesenslalom ist natürlich konditionell auch eine recht große Herausforderung. Ja, schwierig mit diesen Übergängen. Einerseits weißt du, so ist das Grad von, weil du denkst, habe ich kurze Ski. Und andererseits braucht es noch ein Tor ab und zu eine Richtung. Ich mich hat sofort erinnert, dass wir früher wie, wie im Weltcup-Start stehen, so, so ist es zugegangen, ganz weit hoch konzentriert. Und jetzt haben wir ein paar einige gesagt, sie sind brutal nervös. Das ist für den kompletten Skifahrer perfekt, gell? weil so beim Riesenslalom, da kann gleich mal einer vielleicht ganz, ganz gut dabei sein. Aber da oben, da drehen sie dann die Spreu vom Bett. Ich habe mir zuerst mal den Laufen angeschaut und habe die Tücken herausgefunden sozusagen. Das hat dann anscheinend ganz gut gepasst. Natürlich mit dem ersten Platz ist schon was Besonderes und das passiert nicht jeden Tag. Super, ich freue mich überhaupt auf dem Ski, weil auf den habe ich mir am meisten Zeit. Ja, jetzt schauen wir mal, dann am 3.4. wird es in die Lenzer Heide gehen. Und das wird sicher ein cooles Event, da werden wir alle heiß drauf sein und es Beste geben. Well, we're back on the great mountain course where the Swede Igmar Hulström is working hard. He has made no errors in the first round and he must repeat the performance. The Frenchman is close behind him. Yes, very good move from the Swede. But watch out, the Russian Yorkshire is always round for the big moments. Oh, what a mess. Fortunately, the German Friegel is here with his singular technique. Ouch. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Turin, where it's all downhill from now on. Getting ready for his descent is Ootcracker from Canada. He had a great first run, by the way. Might be looking at a medal. Let's see how he does it. Off to a good start, opening with 2.85, well under the schedule for gold, but oh, he's in trouble. He's down. Ootcracker's getting up. Now he's up again, he's up again. He's back on his skis now. Or is it a ski? What an athlete. Ootcracker really is one of the reasons I love the Greenhouse Olympics.
I was a good kid, a strong kid. I'll never be perfect enough for you. I mean, you're stressing the boy out. I lost my way. I'm done. I'm not going to help you anymore until you want to help yourself. Hey, Mom, I never wanted to bring you into this. I just had to get away for a few days. Enjoy the mountain, Eric. Always do. Big storm coming in later this afternoon. This is the craziest winter I've seen in years. First thing we do is we file a missing persons report. The process will probably take about a day or two. I can't wait a day or two. He is out there. Fly myself. I don't think I have too much time. I'm 17 years old. I'm from Brownfield, Maine, USA. I'm Zane Severson. I'm 16 years old, and I'm from Park City, Utah, USA. Je suis Timothée Sivignon. J'ai 16 ans et j'habite à La Cruza, La France. I'm Cole Richardson. I'm 17 years old, and I'm from Camel, Alberta, Canada. This is Quicksilver, Young Gunski. Young Gun Ski, day one. We just packed out the first booter of the trip and the boys are about to throw down. Let's get it. Drop the paper to the shoot. He's a beast. <laughs> Mellow warm up.
It's crazy. This is my first of my life. <laughs> Day three about to go down. Yesterday was a complete huck fest. We'll see what the boys get into today, but I'm stoked. Yeah, that was probably the biggest cliff I've ever hit for sure. By far the biggest cliff <laughs> yeah. I've ever hit. Biggest big. cliff I've ever hit. Big jump for the big position. We're going heli skiing. None of us have ever been heli skiing and we're going heli skiing, so we're stoked. I'm Sammy Carlson, got new schoolers, one and only, Cam Keith. We are your Young Guns judges. Today is the final day. We're about to bump out in the helicopter and we're gonna give away 10K at the end of the day. Well, for the past five days, we've been jamming all around Revelstoke. These boys have been chucking their meat into soft snow, hard pack, and everyone's just been killing it. But there can only be one winner, and we're giving 10K away to our boy, Cole. You're the most consistent all week, and Sammy and I both decided that you're the new young gun. No way! Woo! <laughs> Man, shout out. Course over. The boys and the whole crew for probably the most insane weeks we'll ever have. Let's yeah. go tub.
TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon.